Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. We're very lucky to have all of you together today for this Urban Thinkers Campus, which is a joint initiative between uh, the United Nations Habitat, World Vision, the UN Global Compact Cities <coughs> Program, which I'm a chair of, and RMIT University. We also have support from uh, the 100 Cities Program and the City of Melbourne um, to, to make this a, uh, both a, a, an important day leading up to what is Habitat 3 in October, which only happens every 20 years to set the new urban agenda for how cities will develop uh, into the future. This agreement at a global level will have input directly from today and this is the only gathering around the Urban Thinkers Campus in, in Australia and there's about 25 Urban Thinkers campus, Campuses um, <coughs> uh, globally that are happening leading up to this new agenda. So thank you for your participation. It's important that we pay respect to uh, the Indigenous and traditional owners of uh, this country that we're in and so I'll hand over to Uncle Colin to do a, a, a welcome to the country. Thank you. Look, first I'd like to start off by acknowledging that this morning we are making on the lands of my ancestors, the Warrandry people. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to my elders, both past and present. Elders from all nations, but especially on that devil this morning. Woman Jekka, welcome. For Andrew Ball, him and Country Vic, the Ranger people welcome me around to Lance Day. For Andrew, no, 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 put a ball wall, Condi Nagna, do it a bit, Polly Paul, Chalikin. The Ranger people want you to look after and protect the land as they did long before. Warrandura country extends from the inner city of Melbourne, it goes across the mountains of the Great Divide Range, west of the Warrandura River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east of Mount Borbor. And the Warrandura people are part of the Kulin Nations and of the Warrandura language group. Hello, my name is Colin Hunter Jr. or Willert, Green Possum. Name given to me by my grandmother as a young boy. I'm a proud and passionate seventh generation Warrandura man and a direct descendant of Bibbidgeon who is Nullan Jenner, or head of the tribe at time at first settlement. And it's through my great mother, Gunbriar, Granny White Dove, Granny Tiny on Ennis, she was around to us, mom, that I got Aboriginal culture and heritage in my life today, so for that I say thanks, man. My grandmother was one of the last Aboriginal people born in the early 1920s, of her current English community hospital, before she got moved up to Barma on the Murray of the New South Wales. In Aboriginal culture, a great deal of respect is given to the land, the plants and the animals alike. And I've got that beautiful gum leaves. I'll place them out in the foyer and if you get an opportunity as you're leaving, take a nice one and put it in the pocket for the please. The significance is actually keep you safe while on country and give you the access to the resources of our own country. While you're on your own country, you're welcome to everything from the tops of the trees to the roots of the earth. So we'll enjoy the world. Enjoy the world. will take a leaf later today. As part of this program, there's a couple of things that come to mind and uh, you may not know the UN Global Compact Cities Program, but it started in Melbourne maybe 14 years ago and as part of that process, uh, the City of Melbourne and the Committee for Melbourne wanted to try and tackle complex uh, global issues through collaboration between private sector, public sector and civil society to take on some of those big, big issues. As, as part of that, it's grown to supporting about 125 cities around the world and it couldn't have done that without the support of both um, uh, the, the, the people, the, the collective intelligence and, and the ability to take a program like that and bring it into RMIT to host and support us to grow to 
support other cities. So it's a pleasure to introduce Martin Bean today, who is the Vice Chancellor of RMIT. Uh, he hasn't been at RMIT uh, for very long, just one year, uh, but has made a significant impact in a very short period of time and has a history of both creating open universities in the UK, which has been one of the leading um, or largest universities in, in the UK. Um, he brings a range of knowledge from Microsoft and other places in a, in a long history of taking on innovation, but a passion for education and research. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Martin. Thank you. Morning, everybody. How are you? Uh, Michael, what I'm going to do is just get you to take your book for me for a minute, right? otherwise I will have cards going Sorry. around. Welcome everybody, welcome to RMIT, it's fantastic to have you here and I am just so proud of this, this program, it really is quite, quite remarkable and I'd like you to uh, welcome you to our uh, Urban Thinkers Campus. Um, I hope you enjoy meeting here today in this uh, really quite, quite amazing building, it sort of buzzes with, uh, with sort of innovation and inspiration and, and I'm proud to say that it was designed by one of our RMIT alumnus as well, and I hope you uh, enjoy it as much as we all do when we get to use Building 80 in this space. It's a much-loved space within RMIT. I'd also like to join Uncle Colin in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. RMIT acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the university stands, and I and the university would respectfully like to recognise Elders past, present, and also those for the future. Uh, Uncle Colin had to disappear pretty quickly, but I'd also like to, to thank him. He's a fantastic supporter of the work of the university, and we're currently working on our reconciliation action plan together. And we should have that out in the not too distant future. Michael, thanks for having me. What a, as I said, what an extraordinary program you're running, and one that RMIT is so very pleased uh, to be a part of. Tim Costello is stuck in traffic. But he will be here, we're, we're assured. So imagine that Tim is here right now. Tim, thanks for being here. Uh, but I'd like to thank Tiffany's team at World Vision for working with us together with uh, we, uh, this Urban Thinkers Campus on a really important topic, the ethical city. I also want to thank the team in the UN Global Compact Cities Program, uh, hosted by RMIT, great crew of people who have been diligently working to ensure that this event would be a great success. And when you look at the program, come on in everybody, no need to be shy. When you, uh, when you look at the program and you look at the wonderful speakers and you look at the sort of concepts that we'll be discussing and challenging ourselves to think about today, what, what a remarkable uh, program. Uh, thanks also too to everyone at RMIT who's around the room and at the back of the room who've helped make it happen here today. I'm particularly proud of all the student volunteers we have showing up and the great engagement of our students. Uh, in these amazing topics because goodness knows they're going to be the ones that will have to end up solving many of the challenges that you're going to be discussing today. Uh, now let me start by welcoming some of our guests. I want to express an incredibly warm welcome to Mayor Steve Chadwick. Great to have you here. Okay, right uh, Travelled all the way from Rotorua, New Zealand to join us here uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and it's an interesting time back home, you're going into another election cycle, so brave you to come spend time with us, so relax, you're amongst friends here, okay, you can just be your yourself, but also to all of our other guest speakers who will participate in the panel discussion later, later this morning. Uh, Rotorua Lakes Council is among our partners here today, alongside World Vision and the City of Melbourne, the Resilient Melbourne Initiative, Habitat for Humanity, and many, many more. And after lunch, we'll be joined by our Lord Mayor, Robert Doyle, um, who will share his thoughts on an ethical city. You know, the notion of an ethical city is a real and compelling one for RMIT. We pride ourselves on being a great urban university located in some of the most dynamic and creative cities around the world. You'll find our teachers and researchers not just here in Melbourne, but in Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, Jakarta, Singapore, Shanghai, Barcelona, and beyond. All cities with unique histories, but also with unique challenges. Part of our mission is to help shape a new urban and industrial renaissance in the global economy. And we happen to be the biggest property owner in central Melbourne. So we have a very, very compelling reason to make sure our cities work effectively in an era of deep and transformative change. 
I believe we need a moral compass to help us navigate these changes, especially around issues like climate change, resilience, economic vibrancy, social equity and inclusion. We have to confront the big questions like what kind of energy system do we need our cities to have? What is the future of work in the city? How will we move around it in, uh, in urban, how will we move around in urban areas in the future? And how can we promote inclusion of all city dwellers in the development and productivity of the city? We are going to need people who both ask the right questions and more importantly, develop the right solutions. And that's where I believe urban universities like RMIT have a real role to play in helping address some of the challenges before us. We offer an education deeply grounded in ideas and cross-disciplinary understanding applied through innovative, enterprising practice to solving problems and meeting the needs of our community. This approach is well captured in RMIT's founding motto in 1887, when we started as the Working Men's College, designed to help working adults get access to higher education in non-traditional ways. And our founding motto is a skilled hand, a cultivated mind. And I think a skilled hand and a cultivated mind is just appropriate to the work of a university like RMIT today, as it was back in the late 19th century. I would like to suggest to you today that a cultivated mind is a mind that understands the importance of ethics. By that I mean being concerned about what is right, fair, just, or good, rather than focusing simply on what is seen as normal, or expedient. We need to promote the kind of cultivated thinking in our students and by doing so, we will prepare them for a better life and work in complex and rapidly changing cities around the world. It's clear that 2016 will be the year when global attention will be focused on urban issues leading up to the launch of the new urban agenda at the UN Habitat III conference. Key recommendations from today will inform that agenda, a set of guidelines on sustainable urban development for the next 20 years that will be launched in October at the UN Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development in Ecuador. So your deliberations today will carry weight and I wish you very, very well because we need your brains and your thoughts to feed into those policies. In 2016, ladies and gentlemen, more than at any time in human history, shaping better cities means shaping a better world. I hope you have a fantastic conference. Welcome to RMIT, a remarkable institution. You are all very, uh, very welcomed. And if there's anything that we can do along the way today, please let us know. I'm going to hand back to Michael now, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you for listening. As Martin indicated, uh, Tim's caught in traffic. Uh, it shouldn't be too long, but we thought in, in the short term, uh, it would be great to have an opportunity to introduce you to uh, Professor Ralph Horn, who is the director of the UN Global Compact Cities Program and has been a shining light in, in the research area, both around housing, um, affordability, the climate and greenhouse reduction, um, energy efficiency, all those elements of the um, built environment, but particularly how um, that ethical urban development is a, is a key um, component of the city we want going forward. So I, I thought there's a chance for Ralph to uh, share a few words. Thanks, Michael. That's right. Um, I've just got a glass of water with me because some, somebody very kindly shared uh, some sort of germs a few days ago. So I've got a particularly husky voice today. Let's hope it, it, it holds out. Um, and I understand Tim is, uh, Tim's presence is imminent, so I will talk for maybe 10 minutes or so to introduce some of my ideas, I guess, uh, on, on this concept of the ethical city. Um, while, while Tim uh, makes his way here. 
Um, I, I would also uh, like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners on the, on the land um, where we're gathered today. Um, and I'll also um, make uh, one comment, I guess, in addition to what Uncle Colin said this morning. Um, this, this topic today is about cities, particularly about the future of cities and the form that they might take. And I think it might be worth pointing out that we often, I think, tend to think uh, commonly about our indigenous heritage in Australia being uh, confined now mainly to remote and regional Australia, but that's not true. 60% of our indigenous uh, Australians live in cities. And I think when we think about the future of cities, uh, we do need to think about very, very si seriously about our indigenous heritage and about how, how, um, how we partner in, in, the, in the building of, of future cities. And I should also say that I'm, I'm not an ethicist. Uh, but I, I do feel that after 20 years of research in this area, I know, I, I know something, I have some opinions at least about cities. So that's my starting point, is my long-standing interest in cities and concern about our future cities. And, and it's that that really prompts me um, to, to be involved in this initiative here today. And by cities, by the way, I really mean people. To me, uh, cities are, are first and foremost dynamic clusters of people who who live together in urban settings, surrounding themselves with buildings, transport corridors, and so on. And if they are able to, of course, wonderful public spaces and urban realm. Um, the history of cities over the last 200 years is, is of, of, of places of competitive advantage, people moving to cities uh, in order to improve and better their lives. That's not always how it pans out, but that's certainly one of the un, um, overwhelming uh, drivers of this ur most urban of centuries that we are living in today. <coughs> now, Oxfam recently reported that the richest 62 people in the world, and I mean 62 people, uh, now have as much wealth as half of the world's population combined. I'll just let that sink in for a moment in case you didn't see the same statistic. So th th what I'm saying is the super rich have grown richer. Um, and that means by definition that relatively the poor have grown poorer. No doubt offshore tax havens might have helped in some small way in contributing to this alarming statistic. Even if we assume for a moment though that all the money in offshore tax havens is perfectly legal, my question is, is that the right thing to do? Um, and, and, you know, many will say, you know, uh, if I don't do it, others will. And there's a variety of kind of perfectly legitimising rationales. And I'm not pointing to finger, I'm simply saying I doubt that anyone agrees that 62 people should control uh, as much wealth as 4 billion. Um, so so uh, we, we, when we talk about Australian cities, Australian cities are not the most unequal in the world. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the trends are going, I would argue, in the wrong direction. The ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, now tells us that the top 1% um, in, in Sydney are over 10 times as wealthy as the rest. And Melbourne is catching up. Even more alarmingly, our Australian cities are self-segregating at an alarming pace. What do I mean by self-segregating? Well, I, th I think a, a, a big driver is house prices, which are concentrating rich people into middle ring leafy suburbs and progressively less well-off people are pushed out into distant, unserviced, poorly connected suburbs. Why should we think about the city in the same breath as the word ethical? Well, um, I would say that if nothing else, uh, inequality um, is a starting point in thinking about the ethical city. Uh, and, and I wish to, to make a positive point here. The future of our cities, the course of our uh, future cities is not set. It is something which we have a stake in and we can change. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, is that cities are, are growing. As I said, this is the urban century. As we shift towards 70% urbanisation of the world's population by 2050, our cities have to accommodate over another 3 billion people. Put simply, the urbanisation task globally adds up to us doubling our urban infrastructure in the next 40 years, globally, with major components in India, China, Southeast Asia and Africa. 
as we observe this urbanisation phenomenon, what we see is not so much poverty being eradicated, but poverty shifting to cities. And that was not how it was meant to be, of course. The young, the vulnerable, the poor, the elderly and the disadvantaged are becoming relatively poorer, more segregated and effectively banished to poorly serviced parts of cities that end up further disadvantaging them. At the same time, we're witnessing impacts of climate change, population change, rapid economic change. These changes affect the size of the workforce, the size of the tax base, the nature of the economy, the ability of social and health systems to cope, and of course the ability to actually run cities and build them um, in the ways that we would want them. And guess who loses out the most? So against this backdrop, inequality is endemic, uh, endemic and worsening. If you don't drive a car or live near public transport, and I think you know the rest, um, access to basic childcare, jobs, schools, hospitals, all of this is, is part of, I think, uh, to me, uh, the challenge to create the ethical city. Uh, and I pose three questions. First, how can we build social inclusion, care and respect for all city dwellers? Secondly, how can we maximise the benefit from growth and migration to our cities while also meeting other goals such as decarbonisation or enhancing local food sovereignty? And thirdly, how can we safeguard and pr promote urban culture and heritage to, en to ensure that our future cities are distinctive and unique, nice places to be, if you like? I could go on, but I want, I want to turn our attention now just briefly to this um, thorny question of definitions, because I've been dancing around this topic, uh, this idea of the ethical city. Um, the starting point, I would say, justice, care and inclusion are logically centre stage. But also, I would like to, to argue that accountability, engagement and mutual respect must also be central stage. The ethical city, in many ways, I would argue, is a logical kind of next step for cities, next step for human progress in the urban age. As we increasingly live closer together, we need shared ethics and a focus on care that will become common ground as our individual interests inevitably collide. I'm, I'm by no means the first person to point this out, and I'll just briefly give you three examples um, uh, of, of cases where these possibilities are being developed. And, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's an academic slant on this. There's a, there's a long now um, genre, I guess, of, of work on social justice in the city from David Harvey, Susan Feinstein, and others who suggest that by pursuing deliberate urban development strategies, focused on equality, democracy and diversity, city governance systems can, at least in principle, shape particular environments that enable social inclusion, justice and care relative to others. Secondly, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the World, uh, the world Vision work, um, uh, our collaborators here today, which has shown that you know, by closely working with children and their parents in identifying and designing solutions that shape our future cities, greater social inclusion is possible at the city and local level. So there are tangible projects on the ground that demonstrate this. Uh, my third example would be a completely different one, and just to, just to note the, the new um, New York City plan, 1NYC, the plan for a strong and just city, and I quote, <coughs> Excuse me. This includes measures at, uh, aimed at raising 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty, providing 200,000 new affordable homes, and measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. So I'm, I'm talking here about possibility and practicality. And of course, we've got the Sustainable Development Goals since the last quarter of last year to, as, as, a, as a guiding uh, a set of principles by which we can think about the future, including urban development. We've got the 10 principles of the United, United Nations Global Compact. Just in case you can't memorise them, they're in your paper that you, hopefully you picked up when you came in here. Um, th these are kind of guidance notes that we can use when we're thinking about uh, the ethical city. Um, and, and as I said, there's a, there's a strong positive agenda here, um, not just uh, one that is um, uh, overwhelmingly about concern about the predicament that we find ourselves in. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got a frog in my throat. Um, 
Yeah, so um, a couple of points uh, that I'd like to make before I, before I close and hand over. Um, what, one is that I've talked about cities in very, in very general terms. Um, and, and, and every single city, uh, to state the obvious, is unique. There is no blueprint, therefore, by definition, for the ethical city. Um, every city must create its own uh, future. And, and one idea in this uh, that we might think about this afternoon in our deliberations is, is the idea of a, a, a local compact of ethical principles that applies specifically and directive, directly for each city. Um, one, one that would be made locally in the city um, overtly and deliberately a set of guideposts for each city, a set of signposts, if you like. Um, we would then, of course, have to talk about who gets to make those principles, um, who gets to choose them, how and what governance is involved in, 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 in their adopt uh, adoption and implementation. And, of course, uh, uh, w while I say cities are unique, there are common elements. All ethical city initiatives uh, should, uh, should inevitably, environmentally, socially and culturally uh, be sustainable. Um, they should ut utilise transparent, accountable, respectful, democratic, inclusive mechanisms of engagement. And, and as, as you will have seen if you flick through the, the positioning paper that was available at the, at the uh, stall today, um, this, this afternoon we want to encourage conversations, uh, discussions, um, that will lead to concrete outcomes um, around three topics. Uh, resilience, um, inclusion and the right to the city and ethical city development. And, and of course, w w we could choose more topics than that. This is just an attempt, an initial attempt, to try to, um, to, try to put out, uh, I guess, three key priorities which inevitably are caught up when we think about the ethical city and the future of cities. So in, in conclusion, um, may I say that making, making space for each other, literally and figuratively, is a central concept for my, uh, I guess, my idea uh, when, when, when we talk about the ethical city. And it follows that cities that pursue kind of ethical policies to minimise inequality and propagate mutual respect and social justice offer more resilient, safe and prosperous living environments for everyone. Ultimately, um, those that focus on short-term, utilitarian, partisan or private economic gain um, Will, will be at risk of escalating social disaffection, poverty, corruption, and, and so on. Um, uh, the ethical city, therefore, I think is something which offers, uh, offers to, to all, um, not, just, um, not just the few. And in fact, it offers to all stakeholders. The mayor gets to gain. The, the, the mayor uh, gets a more harmonious and inclusive city, uh, clearer agendas through negotiated and mediated dialogue, um, informed communities and more transparent and accountable governance. Business sectors gain. They have certainty, they have clarity. Open governance and accountability is good for business. And of course citizens are less alienated, better engaged, um, participatory democratic decision making and so on. So I, 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 suppose, um, I suppose what I'm talking about is I think we need, to, we need to think again about what is a fair go in the future cities in Australia. Um, and I hope I've provided a kind of initial sketch for you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Ralph. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce a keynote speaker for you today, uh, Tim Costello is known to, to all of you as, a, I think, a champion and a voice in the community, but a long history of working uh, both in terms of um, uh, community needs right through to what's the type of discussion that needs to be had, and had at a governance level. Um, and he's done that as, as CEO of World Vision for um, quite a number of years now. But the, um, I first uh, met Tim uh, when he was uh, head of Urban Seed, uh, doing a whole range of programs with uh, people living rough in the, in the city and providing, I suppose, pathways. We got involved in a group called Green Collect, which helped uh, take uh, people that were, um, uh, had, had a range of uh, significant issues and gave them a pathway to employment where they were helping with recycling, collection of uh, goods around the city and we help them do waste audits and a whole range of things to interact with corporates 
all up and down Collins Street. And it was a great initiative uh, that still goes and creates that, that bonding between private sector, public and, and civil society. But it's a great opportunity to have Tim with us today to talk about ethical cities. But the, I mentioned foremost that this program wouldn't be on today if it wasn't for the strong partnership with World Vision and the continued um, uh, support and engagement with our program over the last six years. But their involvement with UN Habitat and being uh, a key driver in the region to lead towards Habitat 3, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to work together. So, thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, pretty much as I wrote it, really, Mike. And uh, I uh, want to uh, pay my respect to the Wurundjeri people and uh, thank them for the ceremony performed today. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. Really, this is a discussion about the uh, critical issues uh, facing Melbourne and other cities in Australia and other cities around the world where World Vision works. So thanks to RMIT under the leadership of our Vice Chancellor Martin Bean and the UN Global Compact Cities Program led by Michael Nolan uh, for this event here today. Uh, we at World Vision greatly, collab uh, greatly value the collaboration of RMIT and the UN Global Compact for the Cities Program. So when you think about the urban growth in Australia, it is extraordinary how our cities are just exploding. I had reason to have to drive to uh, Hopper's Crossing yesterday morning uh, to pick up a friend to actually go up to Ballarat. Someone's uh, painting me for the Archibald. Uh, I've had about three or four people paint me before for the Archibald and they never win. Um, <laughs> so as I'm driving there, I'm thinking this is a bit of a waste of a morning and waste of time. But uh, given this morning's conference, it wasn't. What struck me driving from Alston Wicks and Kilda where I live uh, across the West Gate was just that dreadful traffic gridlock coming from Geelong and the West. Why do people live on that side? <laughs> I was thinking, this traffic is impossible. Now, we all know uh, some of the infrastructure debates that we're having at the moment because of trying to get the trucks off the road and get them to the docks and this gridlock. I then picked up my friend and we started going through the back roads to find the uh, back road onto a Ballarat, uh, the, the freeway up there, because there was no point coming back into the city to get on the, the Princess or uh, uh, that turn off because it's just gridlocked. And what amazed me as we went the back routes were little, <clears throat> not so little suburbs that have sprung up with names I have never heard of. I said to my friend, I live in this city. It's been my city most of my life. I've never heard of these places. No one ever asked me for the permission for them to mushroom, and here they are, suddenly everywhere. What I noticed with all of these mushrooming places was that they all had a McDonald's. And they all, I actually had to do a, a, a radio interview uh, with Sydney, uh, Wendy Harmer in Sydney, and I stopped at a McDonald's. That seemed to be the only place to stop to do this. And uh, as I'm talking to Wendy Harmer, uh, a fight breaks out in McDonald's over a table people are trying to grab. And uh, Wendy Harmer goes, what's going on, Tim? This is live on radio. And I said, I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm in McDonald's. I felt quite ethical shame about admitting that. I thought, gee, I'm an inner city snob, aren't I? You know? And then I you know, passed it off, said, I'm a man of the people, Wendy. She said, what's going on? So I described to her the fight going on in McDonald's. It wasn't the topic we were talking about. But it just reminded me that the explosion going on, and we reached the population of 24 million people today in Australia, <clears throat> that uh, this is 17 years ahead of official predictions made at the turn of the century. And that last million, to make us 24 million, has been added in only two years and nine months, really quick, and it's going to get quicker. 
that we're in cities, urban growth uh, in urban areas uh, has driven 67% of the Australian population into a capital city, and that our growth corridors that I was sort of trapped in yesterday are expected to increase by more than 40% over the next 15 years. And 30% of this population will be young people under the age of 24. Well, the other thing I noticed in a lot of these cities, uh, suburbs springing up that I had never heard of, was they didn't just have a petrol station and McDonald's. A number of them had a club with pokies. This really hit me for reasons of 20 years of campaigning on this issue. I uh, was quite struck in the sense of emotional uh, discouragement that the cultural, social life will be brought to you by pokies. Community is now funded and brought to you by pokies. The ethical question of a city is right up there with this highly predatory product that actually is the reason that we say, and or governments, local governments can say we've got some social resources. Why am I so upset about pokies? Because you can't rig a card game at the casino. You can't rig the dice. You can't rig most of the games. Pokies are completely rigged. When you push the button, you've either won or lost. But there will be music that comes up as the first pharaoh comes up, the second pharaoh, the third pharaoh. If you get to the fifth pharaoh, you win. It's jackpot. And it's known as near misses. This will take a whole lot of seconds of your life of suspense and there will be what's called a near miss. You'll get to the fifth line and it'll be just one above or one below and you miss. Now you go, oh well, everyone knows it's a con. No, no, no. This actually is now known, and you can see it with an ABC documentary as Kaching, to be profoundly addictive, these near misses. It's the random reward that we've known in psychology for so long that now we know is as addictive as heroin. It's as addictive as cocaine. For the first time, pokies, a non-substance, it's not a powder, has been put on the DSM as profoundly addictive as that. The other thing going on with the music, of course, is losses disguised as wins. You're playing five lines, you're actually down, but if you have a win on one line, all the music goes off as if you've had a win. <laughs> profoundly addictive. Well, when we think about ethical cities and the fact that Australia has 20% of the world's pokies, 20%. 20% of the world's pokies. And we ask the question of ethical cities, who's bringing community to you now and social recreation? Here is a profound issue. And every state government, hopelessly addicted to the revenue because they might have to do something unpopular if they didn't rely on it, put up stamp duty or payroll tax or something else, and no government wants to do that. Although, as we know, with an $80 billion uh, hole in health and education after Tony Abbott's last budget, Sta taxes are going to have to, state taxes are going to have to go up. Well, whether it's pokies when we're thinking of ethical cities or lockout laws, Mike Baird, who brought them in, now in deep trouble, 40,000 people having signed a petition saying, you are interfering with my right to keep drinking till 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. And even though those coward punches and violent assaults are down 40%. I suspect Mike Baird is going to have to actually reverse his lockout laws. This city culture, though profoundly interdependent, what I do can't help but affect you, the ripple effect because we're living cheek by jail is on us all the time, is a culture that celebrate, celebrates freedom. And any loss of freedom is called a nanny state. And there's nothing worse in Australia than to be called a nanny state. We weren't always like this. When Henry Bolte brought in seatbelts, we were the first country in the world. Wasn't that a nanny state? When Jeff Kennett, and I've reminded him of this, brought in fencing 
around pools in the family home, touching the sanctity of the family home, that was a real nanny state act. It's not that we've always been like this, but right at the moment, in cities with profound inter interdependence, raise a nanny state and it's almost like the end of the argument. We uh, saw in Four Corners that ecstasy is profoundly the mood drug at dance parties and former heads of the Australian Federal Police, Mick Palmer, saying, we've got to admit we've lost this battle. We just need not to have dogs and searching any more parties. Give up. Just have machines te testing the ecstasy. It's very similar to the heroin shooting room debate, saying we can't stop this. We actually have to adapt to this. So in some ways, we recognise the freedom to put into my body whatever I want, to drink to 4 a.m., whatever the violence, is such a powerful force because the city stands for freedom. It stands for pluralism that these forces are on. It's the same even with pokies. Uh, but it raises profoundly this question of what is an ethical city? What what would be the meaning of us framing cities around that wonderful African ethical proposition, I am because we are? In other words, it's not about me. It's not my individual rights. I am quite struck by this individualism and claim for freedom. I was uh, in Paris with my wife. I was walking down a street and I saw this young woman with a T-shirt on. It said, me. Hard to find, impossible to forget. I thought, well, there's a pretty healthy self-esteem parading that, you know, <laughs> as you walk down the street, to total strangers. Fair enough. The next uh, T-shirt I saw was another young woman. My wife, I think, was starting to get worried about what I was noticing, but anyway, it said, Kate is my religion. I was so amazed, I stopped and said, do you speak English? Yes, she spoke great English. I said, is your name Kate? I, she said, yes. I said, Kate, are you your own religion? <laughs> she was very confident. She said, yes, I worship and adore myself. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's great, Kate. Uh, all, all the best with your religion. And we kept going. Well, I'm... <laughs> Not exactly sure these are representative of a whole movement, but it seems to me we have profoundly lost that African idea, I am because we are. Profound interdependence and in an ethical city to actually say sometimes my freedoms will have to be limited because lockout laws have reduced violence by 40% and there's not grieving families and lives that have been ruined forever. My freedoms will have to be limited to play pokies where here you can load up $5,000 in one go. New South Wales, by the way, it's $10,000 in one go. I'm not a prohibitionist with pokies. I've said let's have $1 bets, $120 an hour losses. You're buying your distraction time at a much lower price. You're still getting the recreation. <laughs> But it's a loss of freedom. So it's said, and when the uh, Pokies lobby ran their campaign that uh, actually saw Gillard collapse in her deal with Wilkie, gave us Peter Slipper, by the way. If you're wondering why Peter Slipper became Speaker of the Parliament, it was Pokies. Gillard knowing she was under such pressure from a $40 million campaign from the Pokies lobby that she knew she was going to have to tear up the deal with Wilkie to slow the machines down. She needed another vote because she was depending on Wilkie's vote. That's how we got Peter Slipper. He was always an exploding cigar, but that's how we got him. Pokies. Now, what's my topic? Uh, <laughs> so, to think about an ethical city it really does take us to some very, very critical questions about interdependence about how we live together and who we are and what it means to live together. We know historically that uh, groups could survive in about 150 people. That was a natural 
survival group. You could know just about all of those groups. You could use gossip to know who's bad and who's not. We know that we're settled agriculture that allowed us to feed bigger populations. It saw human ingenuity and innovation explode. You could have specialisation. Not everybody had to be hunter and gatherers. Some could be farmers, some could be writers, some could be architects, some could develop law. We know that. But we still had this trust problem. How do you trust when it's bigger than 150 in these groups? Actually, one of the big ways to trust, and it's one of the explanations of the growth and importance of religion, was if they have the same God and do the same religious rituals, then they are like me. Religion actually was a mechanism to help people trust, to find some sense of bond to live together. Of course, it's now the very opposite with the growth of cities. Rural communities are smaller and more personal and more church attending. The city is uh, driven much more by pluralism and secularism. It is that sense of, I will choose whatever lifestyle, sexual orientation, which is much harder in a smaller rural, particularly religious community, and I will find my niche. Now, to be secular, I think, means to say, in the marketplace, no view is privileged. All is welcome. There's no weight given just to the religious view, because historically that's what was the glue that held us together. But in cities, as we're seeing, there is a real question still, and it's a deep ethical question. How, in that secular marketplace, do we really allow every voice and have a voice, have those voices treat each other with respect and courtesy? Because otherwise we fragment and trust evaporates, and we get gridlocked in our politics, which many countries in the Western world, it's most notable now in America, uh, are certainly finding. In uh, urban context, it's very different to rural context. Uh, I've got friends who are farmers, and our holidays, we'd always go to the farm and go into the little rural towns. I was always struck that in a rural town you have a primary relationship with everyone still, even the town drunk. You talk to them, you know their name. In a rural town you know where everybody is in life and in death. In death you're either Anglican, Catholic, Baptist. You even know where they are in death. You come to a city and it's a very sophisticated city art to actually be on the Belgrave train coming into Flinders Street. It's so packed that you can actually smell what your, the person in your face had for breakfast and for a whole hour's trip not even acknowledge their existence. The ability to pull down that shutter and say this is a secondary or a tertiary relationship, I don't actually need to talk to, that's actually a very sophisticated urban skill. But it raises the ethical question, if they're not primary relationships, how, how do we trust? How with size do we hold all this together? They're ethical questions what we have to face. Well, when we think about the urban growth rates of our near neighbours, they're astronomical. The UN predicts that for the next 15 years, Bangladesh will average over 150,000 people added to its urban population each month. To put this into context, Bangladesh, only two-thirds the size of Victoria, will have more than the entire population of Ballarat, where I was yesterday, added to its urban population every single month for the next 15 years. Even more than this, in India, the UN estimates that the urban population will rise, above, about, rise by 960,000 people per month. That's four times Geelong's population. A million people a month. Urbanisation. And that raises all the aspects we're here to discuss. Adequacy of infrastructure and services, access to education and employment opportunities, density, the sufficiency of public open space, ability to care for and provide dignity, 
to the poorest and most vulnerable, social cohesion. So both real and perceived limitations in urban centres, limitations of actual infrastructure, goods and services, and the extraordinary stress and pressure on the social fabric of cities is already on us. We uh, know with interdependence, and I got here late this morning, just a little bit too much rain in Melbourne, and the traffic all stops. Too much heat and the train wheels all melt. And we just know this stress is, is on us. And with climate change intensifying those uh, heat and cold and weather patterns, we know this is a massive challenge for us. And of course, the youth bulge is at the heart of her urban growth. Here in Australia and in the developing world, um, Europe and Japan are really struggling to replace their youth. Uh, they were young people. But in most other places, young people migrating to the city in search of education, livelihood and opportunities, full of hope and yet incredibly at risk to exploitation and abuse. For us in World Vision, this is particularly seen in child trafficking and child labour and abuse. Well, uh, we mentioned Urban Seed and Green Collect. I did discover in my Urban Seed times, when we'd send our newly minted workers who were coming in to work with us, out on the street, we'd take their wallets, their credit cards, we'd give them a couple of bucks and we would say, you're on your own for 24 hours. Well, where do I sleep? Up to you. <laughs> well, how am I going to survive? Up to you. We would discover the next day when people would come back that they did discover community even on the streets. And this is right at the heart, ethically, of any city. They would say, I was terrified, I had run out of money. People would say, don't worry, the soup van's coming at this hour, or the salvos will be here. Where will I sleep? They said, oh no, we've got a place. There's a squat, uh, you know, in this abandoned building. And they discovered, to their surprise, and we hear a lot of violence on the streets, and that's part of the story, that there's also community on the streets. Right at the heart of big cities, and an ethical city, is this question of community. Where do you find somewhere you belong? This is fundamentally what we're talking about, people, as Ralph said. So the discussion today uh, really is a discussion of promoting ethical behaviour in the city, how you form community, how you understand human need for community, a profound need that is more primary simply than individualism, how we include children and youth in these uh, in these communities. The other thing I want to say that I've seen in my work at World Vision with the push of people into urban areas is often in World Vision, often other aid agencies, we have still a slightly romantic notion of rural. It is still that romanticism of what we saw in Australia, the bush culture. Uh, that there are primary relationships, there's connection to land, and even if you're poor, there isn't pollution in the air. What I've really understood is that for most people, because we're living in a globalised world, even in rural areas, their imagination has been already captured by the city. The city, symbolically, is the place of freedom, of opportunity, of maybe escaping the strictures of a rural uh, morality and traditional lifestyle. Already, the city has won, not just on the figures, it's actually in the imagination of young people who just want to get to the city. That's the metaphor of what a good life will be. Well, when we think about those arriving at the city's fringes with little more than clothes on their back, we certainly can't help but think of the 60 million people who are refugees today. The biggest crisis in terms of refugee placement uh, 
that the world has seen since the Second World War. And when we think of that extraordinary push, again we encounter experiences of neighbourliness. I uh, was in Lebanon, I'd been in the camps, Becca and Becca Valley where World Vision's working, helping provide water and food. We're the biggest partner of the World Food Program to uh, 100,000 Syrian refugees. We're in Syria still and we're in Jordan camps. I was taking a walk to clear my head because I was really troubled by what I'd seen. Refugees who only wanted one thing. They just wanted to go back home, but they're losing hope. Home was just being bombed. Now, five years of war. How do you ever go back? And I was walking in Beirut, and this guy called me over and said, would you like a coffee? And I said, oh, that's very kind of you. Where do you live? He said, just here. I said, sure. Uh, he said his name was Malat, and I said, my name's um, Tim. You speak English, Malat? He said, yes, I'm, I was an orphan. The nuns took me in. I'm a Christian, but they taught me English. I walked into his home, and there was about 15, 20 Syrian refugees sitting around a coffee pot in his home, some women with the full burqa on. And I said, oh, sorry, who are these people? You've got guests. He said, oh, no, they live here. <laughs> I said, they live here. I said, do they speak English? No, no, they don't. Oh, they've been here, he said, nearly 12 months. They're refugees. They had nowhere to go. I said, and they live here in this little house? He said, yeah. And who feeds them? He said, I do. And uh, I said, Malak, uh, as a Christian, I'm guessing you back President Assad. He said, yep, he's a butcher. He's terrible. But because he's a minority Alawite, Christians and minorities will still be protected compared to the Sunni rebels. I said, what, what about these people? He said, oh, they're all uh, Sunni Muslims. They get up in the morning, they face Mecca, and they pray that the Sunni rebels will win. I was really blown away. I said, I know a little bit about family tensions, political tensions under the same roof. I said, but this is extraordinary. Why do you do it? And Malak said to me, because they're human. It profoundly impacted on me. Wrong religion, at least, in Malak's mind. Wrong politics. Because they're human. Well, it's amazing that Lebanon even survives today with uh, nearly 35% of its population refugees. Extraordinary. But here are people like Malak. Well, I tell that picture because this push to the cities is going to need a whole lot more Malaks in cities, understanding that they're human, that this is the primary ethic and we have to find a way, particularly with 60 million refugees. Well, this conference today is thinking about how cities can prepare, how they can increase their resilience and particularly how Development is ethical. Ross Gittings, and I was in Sydney, had a piece in uh, Saturday's Age. I don't know, I assume it might, might have run in the age and you saw it. He said, uh, with this extraordinary blowout of wealth, 62 people owning the same as 3.5 billion people's wealth, is it just technology that's driven it or politics? Uh, technology is an argument that those who create now working in a much bigger marketplace, a global marketplace, have much bigger rewards than just a, a, a small marketplace. Well, Gittins then went through those who have made them at the wealth fast in Australia, and disproportionately it was developers. That's who's made the wealth. And then he said, this blowout in wealth and inequality is because of political decisions, lobbies, Favour, favouring certain groups. We're now going to see a massive campaign against the negative gearing proposals of Labor. And guess what? Most of those campaigning have self-interest at the heart of it. We, are the most we have the most unaffordable housing uh, anywhere in the world. And negative gearing, in my view, is right at the heart of that. So when we're talking about ethics, we're really going to who has power who gets what they want and who misses out. That's what politics is. Who has power? 
who gets what they want and who actually misses out. This was very much at the heart of my time when I was Mayor of St Kilda. I should uh, make an upfront uh, confession. Uh, I was the last Mayor ever of St Kilda. I did such a good job they abolished the whole council. <laughs> it did have something to do with Jeff Kennett and council amalgamations. Uh, but I ran for Mayor for these reasons. I was working as a lawyer and as a minister. I was working with families who had grown up in St Kilda but were poor. And their parents had grown up in St Kilda but were poor. New money pouring into St Kilda, discovering it's only five kilometres from the city, it's near a beach and Luna Park and great public transport and gentrification in the mid-80s just exploded, forcing the long-term St Kilda poor out to Broad Meadows and Dandenong where there isn't a beach, let alone good public transport. I ran for council after reading the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 65 said, they shall build houses and live in them. No longer shall they build houses and others live in them. That really got to me. That's what I was dealing with here. And we got elected and we're the first council to put ratepayers dollars into affordable housing for long term St Kilda poor. We ran a cultural argument saying, it's not just about justice, it's actually about inclusion. The fact that I can walk down Carlisle Street and not look twice or judge the fact that someone's walking down there with their dressing gown on and their hair in curlers and a fag hanging out of their mouth. I said, who wants to be Carlton where you have to drive a be Beamer and wear a Rolex watch to even be there? <laughs> Isn't this great that we have diversity? That argument won and we got elected. The first council to put ratepayers' dollars in. When we're talking inclusion, we are talking also politics, power, and the arguments we mount. By the way, other councils, South Sydney was the next picked it up, saying, yeah, we want to be inclusive. We want diversity at our heart. Well, the uh, important concept here isn't just politics, but it's also business. I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of shared value. The idea that business should make a profit. If it doesn't, it's not in business. But along the way, as it galvanises resources, which is what business is good at, it should have an eye on solving social problems. Shared value. It can do both. And I trust there are business people here. And I know there are business people in this city with that sort of view. Yep, we're in this to make a profit. But just making a profit of itself isn't a complete enough definition of good business. It also needs to say, and what are the social values that our business, social problems, that our business model can also solve? When we come to negative gearing, go and have a read of, in that debate, go and have a read of Isaiah 65. <laughs> they shall build houses and live in them. Well, business leaders are making ethical decisions about ethical and fair trade, avoiding disasters like the Rana Plaza in Dhaka 2013 and 1,100 lives lost, mostly young women's lives lost, just cost cutting. Thinking about supply chains, these are incredibly important in the processes of a, an ethical city. In my role at, as uh, chair of civil society in the G20 process, which was lovely, I got to meet all the leaders from Obama to Putin. Uh, if I had time, I'll tell you about an hour and a half with Putin. That still is troubling me. <laughs> um, but we recommended uh, to those leaders that they need to be thinking about the future of cities. Uh, that they should be developing country action plans on employment, education, training, local job creation, with a specific focus on women, people with disabilities and young people, recommending the partnerships with business and civil society that we're talking about today. Well, let me finish up as my time's coming to an end and saying in World Vision's work, we are very engaged in cities. Cambodian urban pilots, which is really about land tenure security and housing rights, engaging city authorities in dialogue with marginal communities. 
980 million people live in slums and there's very little tenure. 980 million, few rights. This is incredibly important. In India, the uh, Siliguri urban pilot promoting sustained civic engagement. There we've established a citywide network model to address and reduce incidents of child labour and child trafficking. Uh, in Lebanon, the urban pilot project where I met Malak providing opportunities for children and youth to engage in building positive relationships between historically divided groups, Sunni, Shia and Christian. Uh, from Bolivia to South Africa to Indonesia. In Indonesia and Surabaya, we actually had a, a child-friendly city-wide project which got every stakeholder, political and business together. And there, the joy of children realising they're a stakeholder as they painted their dream of what a safe, child-friendly city is. It's been remarkable hearing the voices of children say just what, what they want and hearing them say we're a stakeholder, not that they necessarily understood that word till you explained it and, and drew them into the process. Well, these are the great challenges to address in this urban uh, urban drift. So as I finish, let me encourage you to use your imagination to really ponder the ethical issues and then to realise that there will be questions of power. It does lead to politics. It does lead to choices. Those political decisions, who are they made by? I. Uh, committed social suicide last week, um, I uh, recommended we bring back an inheritance tax, commonly known as death duties. 27 OECD countries have them. I worked out that if it's over $5 million when you die, it doesn't affect 99.2% of the population. And I worked it out that why does America and Britain's rich give four times more to charity than Australia's rich. I thought it was just cultural, that we're, our rich are just mean. No, the difference is inheritance taxes, because in those countries, most countries, you, if you don't trust government, you can actually leave in your will what you'd be paying to government to charities. This is why it's four times higher. It's always an economic motivation, isn't it? Well, I committed social suicide because do you think Neil Mitchell went for me or not? And Tom Elliott went for me or not? How shocking it is that we pay our taxes and when we're dead. I said, the best time to pay your taxes is when you're dead. <laughs> I said, if you, if you leave, you should provide for your kids. But if you leave too much for your kids, you'll only ruin them. <laughs> this is why Buffett and Gates are arguing against Donald Trump. Trump wants to abolish inheritance taxes, estates taxes in America. And Buffett and Gates are saying, no, we should pay. Stable government and hospitals, schools and legal system with, which honours contracts is why we're rich. We should be paying back. Well, this became unthinkable, social suicide, even to dare to suggest it. Now, I tell this story because I finished on politics. Remember, the rich will always squeal, and they have lots of powerful friends. And you might decide an estate five million plus isn't that rich. I'm open to doing being eight million. By the way, it raises about five billion dollars. But I was just extraordinarily blown away how they squealed, how loudly they squealed. I loved Neil Mitchell saying, I'm smothered in self-interest because I was arguing for charities. I would have thought that's the opposite of self-interest. I didn't dare say, would there be any self-interest on your part, Neil, uh, here? It is always a question of politics. It will come to that as we get clear around what the ethical issues are. Thank you. We'll open up to questions. Please um, uh, put up your hand if you want to ask a question. Rama? 
Thank you very much, uh, Tim. That was fascinating. Very, very inspiring. You talked about um, the culture, you know, that um, mm, uh, about perkies, about alcohol, and uh, um, uh, cities, of course, you know, develop their own cultures, and some of these cultures don't remain within the cities. It just goes uh, everywhere. Um, well, apologies to all coffee drinkers here. I would like to talk about coffee because mm. that doesn't come up very much. Mm. And, um, you know, like I go to visit other cities, other countries, and I meet a Melbourneian and says, I don't get a good coffee here. It's pretty common that I hear that. Mm. But, you know, thinking about when we're talking about ethical cities, again, thinking about what coffee is doing and, um, you know, how it is devastating livelihoods and is uh, depriving um, people to grow their own food and leading to hunger and poverty. Mm. It's, a, it's you know, so much of a cycle that goes through. So thinking about those things and is, is also very important because we tend to forget some of those basic fundamental things that happen in our daily lives. Yeah. <laughs> well, whether it's <coughs> coffee, or whether it's cocoa, and Martin Thomas, who's here from Habitat, he and I travelled to Ivory Coast and Ghana and just saw the uh, extraordinary child labour, terrifying child labour in the cocoa plantations of those countries. Why? Just so that we get to eat cheaper chocolate. And coffee is another really powerful example. Um, you're talking to a person who is complaining if I'm in America or... Uh, uh, London that they don't do good coffee and that's why Australians were exporting to New York and London and they they're doing very well but the the question of the f supply chain the distortion of what you plant uh, and the ripple effects I think is profoundly important and it's a really good point to make you can talk big ethical pictures of cities if you're really wanting to advance the case talk concretely, chocolate, coffee, and how, how you follow that story because people actually get that and then can change their consumption patterns if they get it. Uh, thank you, Tim. Inspiring as usual. I'm, I'm very interested in your opinion and what you think we might be able to do to shift the arguments around the TPP, in particular around ISDS, and how you see that impacting coffee, chocolate, <laughs> uh, and the various uh, lack of ethical componentry in, in such a, a massively corporate um, architecture of trade. Yeah, so G G20 was an attempt to remind world leaders that nationalism is failing us, that uh, all our problems are global, that we have to find some ways of global governance and transparency uh, to actually deal with the tax havens, with the fact that our, our aid to the poor world, all government aid to the poor world, more than 10 times it just flows out into tax havens by corrupt rich. Of course, we've seen the US has been the most resistant to deal with uh, that issue. Uh, it was an attempt to say whether it's climate change, whether it's global uh, uh, epidemics. We now are a global village. And I might just say Marshall McLuhan was really interesting. When in 1962 he came up with that term global village, we all said, wow, a bit early, you know, because nationalism and borders are strong. Marshall McLuhan then said, actually, we're not a global village, we're a global theatre. He said, we're all sitting in the dark from all around the world. We're all watching the same thing happening on stage, and that's what I mean by urbanisation as one in seizing the imagination. But because we're sitting in the dark, we're having totally different reactions to what's happening on stage. And when we turn the lights on and go out, we only go out with our own groups, and that, our group might have liked it. We didn't notice others hated what's happening. And they're angry and they're upset because we actually were all sitting in the dark. Now, when it comes to TPP and those agreements, you know, free and fair trade, and fair is always dropped, is, is a good thing. But when ethical 
commitments are dropped in the interest of just, it's called red tape, it's called bureaucracy. Uh, a whole lot of us who have been watching the free trade movie on stage are going, no, we're really worried about this and this is the implication and it's as if no one quite listens. Look, the best bet uh, if you're against the uh, TTP is Hillary Clinton. Um, she, I was interested to see she came out uh, against it. Um, that's, that's, you know, at the end of the day, whatever issue it is, whether it was climate change, what happened in my view, very simply in Paris, was the big boys, China and America did a deal and banged heads. If it's going to be ending the Syrian war, which is a war by proxy, us behind Saudi Arabia and America being part of that, leading it, Russia behind Iran, it's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The only way we're going to end it is if America and Russia get together and bang heads. Whether it's an issue now of TTP, um, TPP, uh, it's going to really be American leadership that determines ultimately whether it's going to go ahead or not. Uh, that seems to be the reality of power politics to me. Thank you very much, David Sanderson from the, the University of New South Wales. And thank you, Tim, for your words and everything you said. And I was struck by you mentioning Bangladesh and the garment collapse factory in Dhaka so well known, also just under a billion slum dwellers around the world. And as we know, <coughs> corruption is one of the big problems and one of the perpetuators of poverty and certainly urban disasters. And I'm wondering your views on what societies and those within society at all levels can do about that. Yeah, corruption is the big problem, and uh, it's why World Vision money never goes near police or government, and why uh, we, we were deregistered by uh, Mugabe before uh, elections because we were doing the biggest food programs. He wanted to take it over to win votes, and we said no. Um, so I, I think on this issue of corruption, the uh, really important thing, and there's a, a great book called Thieves of the State, I don't know if you've seen that, that says if you want to analyse really what was going on in Afghanistan and why they welcomed the Taliban, why initially they even welcomed ISIS, some of them, was they saw them as not corrupt, didn't like the religious fundamentalism and the strictures and uh, what they're on paper, but they're saying at least they're not corrupt. And that book just says, if instead of billions of dollars and lives lost in military confrontation, we had taken seriously corruption, we'd taken that seriously in Afghanistan and those parts of the world. And if we would take it seriously ourselves, I mean, I, I, I at one G20, I, I actually, you know, laughed out loud, which is very naughty, because there was David Cameron sweat on his brow, pounding the podium about, you know, the Googles and Microsofts and Starbucks and others uh, not paying their tax. This had been brought to light by civil society in London, saying, why are we paying our tax and they aren't, and saying, this must stop. Well, so many of the world's tax havens have postage stamps with the Queen's picture on them. And I thought, this is really interesting in indignation. Uh, now, the Brits have come a fair way. America's the one that's really holding us back. Um, but that's corruption. Why should tax havens even exist? Why should they even exist? That's my ethical question. Why should they even exist? So, when we're talking about corruption in the Bangladeshs and Africas, absolutely it is the core issue, but it's also a pretty profound issue here too. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll finish it there. Thank you. If you'd like to uh, thank Tim Costello. Uh, we've got to the point where we're going to give you a break. There's a, a breakout area up the top. I failed to mention that if there was um, some sort of emergency and you started to hear the, the whoop whoop noises, uh, that you calmly and carefully make your way 
out the exit post here and up, up the top uh, to leave the building. I don't imagine any such thing would, would occur. Um, we're going to have a break for half an hour. We'll be coming back to a panel session which will help us further explore a range of the issues around the ethical city. So um, look forward to seeing you in, at 10.30. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to facilitate uh, the next session today, um, which is a, a multi-sectoral debate, hearing from different um, sectors of society uh, around the question of how can cities build a sense of shared value for its dwellers, especially the most vulnerable, um, to promote an ethical city that we need for the future. Uh, before we begin, I thought I'd just very quickly introduce myself. My name is Mike Pousty. I'm with World Vision as one of their urban technical specialists. Um, and World Vision is really concerned um, about these ideas of um, urbanisation and really do desire to seek um, ethical urban solutions in the communities that we are working with. Um, World Vision uh, has been investing in this urban space for the last eight years, um, realising uh, that, as we've already heard today, the 21st century has not seen the end and eradication of poverty, but rather the urbanisation of poverty. Uh, some of the most poor and most vulnerable are now urban dwellers. So with us here today, um, so we've already met uh, Ralph, Professor Ralph Horn, uh, from the UN Global Compact Cities Program. Uh, Ralph is not actually going to be uh, presenting uh, in this session but we'll be responding and providing feedback and just reflections, uh, like myself, um, from our other <coughs> speakers. Uh, next to Ralph, we have uh, Toby Kent, uh, who is currently the City of Melbourne Chief Resilience Officer um, with the Rockefeller um, <coughs> Resilient Cities um, Program. Uh, previously to that, uh, he was with both KPMG and yeah, AN... Sorry? PwC. PwC, sorry. <laughs> same thing, same thing. <laughs> uh, was with PwC and ANZ um, leading their sustainability um, programs. Um, Doug Reagan, Doug, Douglas Reagan, is the uh, Chief of uh, Youth and Livelihoods with um, UN Habitat. Uh, Doug oversees UN Habitat's um, Global Youth Livelihoods programs. Um, and has come out from um, Kenya, um, Nairobi, for this event. So we're really privileged to have uh, Douglas with us and looking forward to hearing his uh, input on this, um, this issue. Uh, Steve Chadwick um, is the Mayor of uh, Rotorua Lakes Council. Yes. I know my pronunciation is terrible. It's not rotten. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, not and now, since you're Mayor. <laughs> and Steve will be uh, speaking to us about uh, the role of, of local cities, local councils, um, and, and telling some of her stories of the way that she has um, seen these questions of um, ethical cities um, played out in her context. Um, next to, to Steve, we have Martin Thomas, um, who is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Australia. Um, World Vision and Habitat have worked uh, closely um, over the last few years. Um, Habitat is very um, driven to see improved uh, housing, dwelling and security um, for some of the most vulnerable uh, in many countries around the world. And finally, John Watson will be presenting and sharing with us a perspective from the media. Uh, what is the role of the media in advancing ethical cities? Um, so John is currently the, the city's editor um, with The Conversation, um, but has previously also been a, a writer and editor with The Age. Uh, so the purpose of this session uh, today is to both hear from um, different voices of the city, um, but then at the end there will also be plenty of time uh, for questions and answers uh, from the floor, 
Uh, so I encourage you to, uh, as you are thinking, to be asking the question of, from your perspective, um, how can you be uh, engaging in advancing ethical cities? And what are the, the questions, the ideas that you are hearing uh, that you would like to dive deeper into? But uh, without any more delay, um, I'd love to uh, invite uh, Douglas Reagan um, from UN Habitat uh, to share uh, his reflections um, on the role of, of cities and um, the role of Habitat 3 uh, and the new urban agenda um, in advancing the city that we need. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. I have been just off a plane for about 27 hours, so if I start wandering off and talking about my children or something, someone just throws something at me. Um, I'm, my role here is kind of for two purposes. One is more on the formal side. Um, this, uh, this Urban Thinkers Campus is part of a larger process that we at UN Habitat are doing. UN Habitat is this, the UN agency focused on cities. Um, we have been around since for about 30 years or so. And we're coming up on our big 20-year uh, conference uh, that's happening in October this year. Uh, and we're focusing on what we're calling the new urban agenda. And this process, this Urban Thinkers Campus, is one of many. We're looking at about 25 or 26. I just came from an Urban Thinkers Campus in Nairobi with 300 young people from 17 different countries in Africa. Uh, and there's been many, many others. I, I technically, you're supposed to go to one in Mannheim the day after tomorrow, which I'm not going to do. But nonetheless, it's, it's a, uh, it's real, this is the, this, this stream, this urban, and this urban thinkers campus stream is very much kind of the civil society stream of the larger process. Habitat 3, which again is happening in October in Quito, is also has a formal stream where, because this is a member state conference, it's all the General Assembly members coming together and saying, what do we think about cities in the next 20 years? Similar to what happened in the Rio process and other processes, the women's process and so on. So we're really trying to define that agenda and you guys are part of it. So yes, it's great you're here. And again, thank you so much for coming. Um, so that side, so there, there you go. So there's gonna be some report that comes out of this. That report is gonna be put together with 20 some odd other reports. It's gonna go into a larger civil society process. And in the end, in some magic, we're gonna come up with some document that's gonna come, happen uh, in October called the New Urban Agenda. Uh, I can't tell you more on how that works. It's, it's, it's uh, quite interesting and sometimes sad and sometimes very good. Mm. Um, as is the UN in general. Um, on the, <laughs> uh, and to give you a bit of background for myself, um, I have been at the UN as a staff person for the last uh, four years now, living in Nairobi, Kenya with my family. Um, but I'm an NGO guy, so I, 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 I love the UN for what all it's worth, and, and I also have a healthy skepticism of it. So if you have criticisms, please feel free. I'm, you won't hurt my feelings. Um, on the flip side, my second passion is cities and youth. Um, I, I head up the youth unit for UN Habitat. Uh, when I speak, I often talk about the two, two trends of the new millennia. One is youth, one is urbanization. They're both happening. Um, if you've, uh, on this urbanization side, I know, I'm, I'm sure these stats have been rolling out, but I mean, we're looking at, as of 2007, there were more than, th at that point in time, that's when more than 50% of the world's population lived in cities. Since that time, we're, we're looking at, you know, 60, 70% over the next 20 years. In many areas, if I'm, I'm coming from Africa, it's, um, uh, it's slower on urbanization, but still it's incredibly impactful in both very negative and very positive ways. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at that, and when we're looking at moving towards the conversation about social inclusion and what that, me that means, uh, again, I reflect back on the Urban Thinkers Campus that we just had three days ago now in Nairobi, um, and with, again, 17 youth, 300 youth, 17 countries, seven of them being post-conflict or conflict countries, mm -hmm. Somalia, DRC, uh, Burundi, um, uh, uh, CAR, uh, and, and many different countries. And it, the, the conversations were quite amazing and it's quite fascinating to talk. I mean, it's quite sad in some ways because of the horrific situations that young people are faced in, but also quite amazing the resilience of young people. And especially in these, in these places and in cities which are generally youthful anyways. 
So for us, social inclusion to me means participation. Social inclusion means participation in the economy and actually have the economy actually work for you but also <laughs> allow young people to work, you know, come into the economy. But partnered with that, it's not just jobs, jobs, jobs. It's also governance and dignity. When we talk with, I, we're doing a very big project in Mogadishu, Somalia right now and I can tell you when we sit down and talk with both gov government officials from Somalia as well as young people, they do talk about jobs, but they also talk about the fact that they need to feel that they're heard, that they need to feel they have impact. And so the, and the, the places they do that in Mogadishu is an amazingly diverse and, and uh, um, place that, yes, has um, very difficult uh, situations, but also has an amazingly diverse and um, active youth population. In the fact, of the, um, we're, I work very closely with the Envoy and Youth to the Secretary General, his name's Ahmed Al Handawi, he's from Jordan. Um, I was able to ho host him in Mogadishu uh, a year and a half ago. And one of the things he noticed, being an Arab speaker, is he said, well, this word Al-Shabaab. And who knows what Al-Shabaab means? It means youth in Arabic. So his point at that time was to say, we have to find the real Al-Shabaab. We need to refine this term that has been stolen from the young people, stolen and become a word that is equated to terrorist, and take it back as a part of a word that means young people and all, that, all the positive things young people need. So again, I, I mean, I'm really excited to have this conversation, and I'm not going to go on much longer. I think that it's just that the, the concept of social inclusion and actually the new concept that I've just learned, being in Kenya, we don't always catch up with the, the, the terms all the time, but the shared value <laughs> is also really important. And we have some amazing examples of how young people have come together with the private sector, young people have come together with the civil society sector, and as leaders, and they are leaders, they're not just leaders to be, they are leaders now, young people have been able to develop some amazing programs, and I'm, we, as we move through, I can talk more about them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doug. Really good to hear uh, those reflections on social inclusion for youth, meaning not only inclusion in the workforce, um, but to have their voice heard, uh, to feel they have impact, and really to, to underscore the role of youth as leaders of today, um, not only of tomorrow. Um, but maybe next we'll move uh, to Steve. Um, Steve, governments are talking lots, promoting um, sustainable, livable, smart, healthy cities. Um, ethical behaviour, ethical cities. It would be great to hear your reflections um, <coughs> on the journey um, to building community cohesion um, and what that has played out and looked like um, in the context that you've been involved. Thanks, Steve. Mark, uh, uh, kia ora everybody and uh, we come from New Zealand so we always acknowledge our people and our people that I represent in the heart of um, New Zealand, the heartland is the cultural heartland and the tribe is Te Arawa. and I wouldn't go anywhere at home without someone from Te Arawa beside me but it's fantastic to be invited here today I never go to a group of thinkers on urbanisation and urban thinkers like you. I have a background in um, central government 12 years as a member of parliament and I chaired the parliamentarians on population and development committee under a Helen Clark led government. Whoopee, what a fantastic um, learning curve that was for me. And after politics, because I want to be perfectly frank, everything has a cycle. And we had our cycle and it was time for change and you go away and reinvent yourself. And I worked around the Pacific and Asia on population and development issues in um, developing countries in um, the South Pacific. And then people said, come back and be the mayor. Well, you feel a bit like a failed politician and should you go back and be the mayor? <coughs> but you had skills dripping off you about social inclusion, about democracy, about fairness. And uh, I stood on an agenda in a, in a really, a, community that had lost its heart, completely disconnected from what was happening in City Hall, uh, didn't have a, a, an optimistic <coughs> future, empty shops, empty um, city heart, and didn't feel very good about ourselves. So I spent a year 
going around think leaders, if only I had a room like you, uh, to work with to say, have you thought about, have you thought about, have you thought about? <coughs> and so we talked about re-energising because we live on a geothermal cold era. So we talked about ge um, geothermal energy, what we could do with that um, fabulous resource, what we could do with the forests that surround our area and, and look at a wood first policy and what we could do to reinvigorate a very stale tourism destination. So I stood and it was a fantastic campaign with a huge groundswell of what I enjoyed, people from any party. So it was nice to park the body politic, but never in your heart, and work with people that really wanted to reinvigorate the place again. When we got in, we went up, we were a weird bunch that got elected. No one stands on a ticket. And um, I certainly stood for strong leadership. <laughs> and I took them all up to the top of a mountain where we've got a fabulous restaurant with a view out over the city. And I said, what's it going to look like in 30 years' time? And it's our responsibility now to plan um, how this place is going to work, how the people are going to feel about the place, and from a very diverse group of individuals that got elected, we came up with a Vision 2030. It took us four days of strategic planning. Politicians are not good at doing that. They don't like it. They want to know who's going to be the chairman of the finance committee and the chairman of the infrastructure committee and how much extra money they might get with those portfolios. And then I brought a cabinet experience um, into our thinking with this vision 2030 and decided that when politicians get bored, they get naughty and they become um, a nuisance. So we'd have portfolios and uh, those, those um, elected councillors would lead a portfolio. And we developed seven portfolios about things that we believed in and I was absolutely delighted to see that it was those with a business heart, those that were developers, had a heart about the fact that our real estate was in a poor state, that our homes didn't meet, meet the needs of our people, one portfolio, sustainability. And so I knew what sustainability was all about, um, but how on earth were we going to get this conversation out in the community? We had another portfolio about revitalising the city heart, Another one about open spaces, so that we would really treasure the open spaces and the land that made us the people that we are, and another people portfolio. And the people portfolio is the most interesting story for me, because 37% of Rotorua are, are Indigenous people, and young people, who might leave home to go to get uh, a career or um, education opportunities, but want to come home and have a job in their own city and their own district. And we, they had a sense of hopelessness about their future. So um, this portfolio thing caught fire and a lot of them said, what do I do now that I've got this portfolio? So council absolutely restructured. 80 jobs went <coughs> and we developed portfolio leads within council so that the structure of our council the structure of City Hall completely reinvented itself to meet the portfolio needs that led towards a vision of partnership with the people. And the lesson that I learned most was that we were disconnected from the indigenous people of Rotorua. And I went on to our marae, which is our community living centre, and um, was welcomed on there and said that we're going to develop an enduring partnership with the tribe. And that has been the most contentious thing of my mayoralty. And the, the message here is if you're going to be a mayor that wants to last the distance, you've got to do the brave things. And to me that's ethical. And it's doing what is right. But knowing that you've got a team behind you that is sold on the proposition is what we as a team can do for our district. So that was a journey that took 18 months. I formed a wonderful opposition in our community um, of people very frightened of change, um, people that had never had an open conversation about racism and on bicultural issues, let alone multicultural, in a 
tourist destination, and yet we got there. And we got there in the end, but I have to say when we put the vote to council after 1900 submissions, five weeks of hearing from the community of um, concerns, a bit of hatred, uh, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of very positive submissions. When we got there, I felt the lifeblood drain out of me. And I thought I never realised at the time that I set out on this journey to develop a partnership with the people of the land who gifted our entire land for the growth of our township uh, that I would feel so sapped, really, of energy. However, now we've got um, people from the tribe sitting at the council table making decisions with us. Inclusive. They feel part of what we're planning for our district and they don't feel they're sitting as an <coughs> advisory committee in another room, as they said, with the door locked and mm -hmm. not listened to. So it's an exciting journey. It's uh, our first in New Zealand and other mayors are saying, how do you do it? Why did you do it? Um, and I thought there's nothing like a bit of wisdom and experience in your life and I think the toughest thing that I ever took on in Parliament was to make New Zealand uh, smoke free in bars and cafes and I was pretty nanny state then, uh, pretty loathed but I thought as a midwife um, who had delivered 5,000 babies it was probably a good face to say it's a healthy thing to do. Uh, to, to be a country on a journey and on a pathway towards a smoke-free future. So this felt like it was nothing working with the tribe to do the right thing, but actually it brought out what is in every community, issues of great concern, anxiety, and my job now, if I get re-elected, is how we get those people feeling part of our community and not seen as a group of antagonists outside of, of our council table. So doing the right thing for me is a highly ethical driver, but building a team around you and getting that team to understand what you can do in the art of the possible as a district is also very exciting. <coughs> and actually having to inspire central government, because politics is the art of the possible, about why don't you look at some of the policies in your <coughs> central government machine um, that could make a better life in communities um, like every small community. So you've got to be optimistic, uh, you've got to have a vision, you've got to be measured on the vision, you've got to be very transparent. Uh, we opened the box and found debt just sort of pouring like blood. Um, and we had to stem that flow uh, of debt and um, so that was a very interesting financial transparency um, process that we had to go about. And now our community is really saying we're reinventing ourselves, we're feeling good about ourselves, everything is going up. We've got fewer empty shops, we're building a library and a children's hub in the heart of the city with a playground around it. We're starting to build, we've got four buildings being built in wood solutions, which I'm really excited about because that will start to tumble. We're surrounded by forests, so it was sort of oxymoronic to be exporting logs to China and not doing something with that wood. Uh, and we're looking after our 14 lakes. So why did we start this journey? I'll finish there. Well, I worked in a government that understood st sustainability, and I invited Helen out to just ask, actually. I said, come and have a meeting at City Hall, and we'll have a conversation on the stage, and a gold coin donation, and that money will go to youth development projects in our city. And she said, of course I'll come. And she said to me that night, why don't you join the UN Compact of Global Cities? And I said, I don't even know what it is. And so she told me where to go to come to NMIT and we started that journey. And I found it a fantastic experience to admit what you don't know, seek help from academics who have got a diaspora of research and um, have you tried this, have you thought of this? And now we're going back, uh, we've got a community-led portfolio mm -hmm. of sustainability, not 
councillor led but a very big community group of experts far more knowledgeable than me and we're starting to work out the action plan toward being a sustainable city. So it's very exciting. Um, if I get turfed out at the next election, I started my life bringing babies into the world, and I'll probably go and set up as a funeral director and take them out. <laughs> <and the other. laughs> uh, but thank you for inviting me here. It's much more than this. It's much deeper than this. But it is about finding the, the hook that engages the partnership and the natural intelligence which is in every community. It doesn't have to be huge. I heard Tim and sort of laughed because uh, it's so big. It's bigger than Texas, isn't it, really? Mm. But we're reducing it down to our place, our people, and the propositions and the beliefs that matter to us to craft our own future. Thank you for listening. Mm. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, one thing which came to my mind while you were speaking about that was when you're reflecting on uh, the need to be brave to uh, do the hard things but that are also the right things, um, it just resonated with me again of what, what Tim was saying this morning of <coughs> um, being willing to sacrifice uh, for others, being willing to sacrifice the easy out, uh, the easy for the sake of the right decision even when that's hard. Um, so thank you for your input and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts during the question time. Now as much as organisations like World Vision or Habitat for Humanity would like to think that after government, uh, the non-government um, sector is the most powerful, um, I think there's no question that actually it's the business sector. Um, which has a lot of influence in the direction and the future of the cities um, that we will be experiencing over the coming decades. Um, so I'd now I'd like to invite Toby uh, Kent um, to just reflect on, um, from your experiences in business, the role of business in achieving ethical cities. Uh, so I guess there's a possibility that there are two schools of thought in the room at the moment, i.e. one going, why is this person who seems to have a business background working in a city space and another group of you going, why is this person in the city talking about business? And so it's interesting in terms of things being interconnected and so forth. I was talking with Doug just before we kicked off. So my move into the business sector actually came through the UN Habitat where I worked in the same building that Doug is now uh, about 20 years ago. And my work there was investigating the role of the corporate sector in addressing how East Africa's housing needs. And that took me from a short contract with the UN into consulting to businesses, uh, really focusing on how to be more effective, more profitable businesses while engendering better social and environmental outcomes. And I guess that mix of having uh, an urban background um, and then sort of uh, the work that I've done across many different stakeholder groups is what uh, hopefully made me uh, uh, a reasonable candidate for the role that I now fulfill. I think the other thing um, that Doug mentioned was, you know, that the UN, when it's great, is great, and uh, it also has some of its uh, some, some certain flaws. Um, one of the things that the UN both does and is is it reflects its membership, which is every country in the world. And actually, the UN has done a few things in terms of reflecting trends. So, in 1997, you had Habitat 2 and the big uh, urban future focus. The other thing that came after that was Kofi Annan, the then Secretary General in 98 and 99, announced the UN Global Compact for Business. Now, it's interesting, a lot, not a lot of people necessarily know this, but Kofi Annan, uh, his father was a manager for Unilever in Ghana. And actually, I believe that it is his experience in seeing the power of this large multinational company trying to operate in responsible ways in West Africa that actually large, played a significant role in informing his views on the power and importance of business, united under the banner of the United Nations and the work that's going, was, was going to needed to go on. And now rolling forward 20 years, um, you know, while the, the Global Compact Cities program has been around for longer, I think this is a great sort of re-energizing of it here in Melbourne. Um, and I guess as my role 
uh, thinking about the, the future and prosperity of Melbourne as a whole. I'm thrilled to see you know, the role that uh, Monash has taken in helping to drive the Sustainable Development Goals, profoundly UN-linked, of course, yeah. the work that is going on with, here with RMIT and the University of Melbourne, which will, uh, is currently recruiting for a new chair in urban resilience. So hopefully as well that we are a city that can contribute to this uh, fundamentally global debate. Um, so just quickly, um, that said, um, you know, why would business, what, is the, what are the sort of fundamental underpinnings for why business would be concerned about the, uh, the ethics or the, uh, an ethical city uh, or indeed more simply just a, a, uh, a just city? And I think it's sometimes forgotten, um, both within business and outside it, but business, just like a city, is fundamentally made up of people. I know that sometimes we do our best to get the people out of it, but the reality is that business is at heart a collection of people selling services, hopefully, that are needed and products to other people. And so I think that there are so many things in life, and particularly if you're coming through a kind of an ethical lens, that have to start, and I love Tim's phrase uh, talking about uh, the uh, gentleman in, the, in, 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 in Lebanon, he said, why? Because they're human. You know, that so much of what we have to do comes back to because we're human. And so I think if you sort of start, have that as your starting point, but then rolling on from that, um, cities, uh, sorry, businesses exist within cities, these human constructs, and they want a secure and safe operating environment. They don't want the overheads that go along with increased security. Um, they don't want the uncertainty of disrupted supply chains. So at a purely pragmatic level, while I still say always hold the human bit to dear and close to the heart, but at the same time, from a purely pragmatic level, there are just those sorts of senses. Equally, um, the people, if you're in a prosperous city, people will buy more of your goods. Um, it is as simple as that. You want a healthy economy to, to, to drive a, a thriving business. So I think um, there are all, all of the, sort of those, those components feeding into to this. The other thing is that if you take the definition of cities, and I now work as part of the one, uh, sorry, of urban resilience as, uh, as promoted by the 100 Resilient Cities Network that uh, I in part represent, it is that um, urban resilience is about the ability of a city, its institutions, organizations, uh, businesses and systems to adapt, survive, and thrive in the face of whatever shocks and stresses come their way. And the reality is that a business, uh, and just, sorry, very quickly, so the shocks are basically the, the big and scary things, be that uh, heat or bushfire, flooding, or human-generated activity, cybercrime, so forth, and the stresses are the things that if we don't address them over time, under, sort of unpick at the fabric of society, so social inequality, lack of access to housing, um, health uh, issues and, and, and so forth. And so business actually uh, wants its people, and many of those people make up businesses' workforce, to be best equipped as possible, both to uh, manage when times are good, but also to be back up on their feet and running uh, when, they are time, when, when times are bad, be that at a kind of citywide level or in terms of uh, people's own individual uh, resilience. So um, I look forward to any questions, and I will hand over to whoever is next up. <coughs> it doesn't make sense um, that businesses would want the good of their city. Um, and that was something which, again, just, just stood out to me, that even from a purely business sense, it makes sense uh, to want the good of your city. Um, so having heard reflections on the role of government, uh, the role of business, um, Martin, you are uh, CEO in Australia for Habitat for Humanity. Um, you know, the provision of affordable housing um, is a really key um, role, has a key role to play in lifting people out of vulnerable situations. Um, reflecting on your experiences, um, discuss a little bit around um, issues of ethical sourcing or corruption, um, informal and formal um, players and the roles that they all have 
in uh, advancing ethical cities that we sure. hope to hear from you. Sure, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, Habitat for Humanity, is, uh, as you heard, focuses on housing. So one of the good things is whenever you get a question like this, it's always going to be about housing. So it's, <laughs> it's terrific. You get a, a free ride in terms of uh, being able to talk about the, uh, the issue that we focus on. Um, for us, I guess cities are just so critical in terms of uh, breaking the, uh, the cycle of poverty. Uh, and it's the things that are self-evident. If you have a house, you've got a safe, warm place to live in. You can lock the door at night. Your family are safe. It helps you hold down a job. Helps you, your kids to have light to study by. So all those things, I think, are self-evident. But I think there's also those second generational things around a house, that you actually come together with neighbours and actually have a voice. You're actually recognised by governments in many uh, areas. So there's an advocacy sense mm. that happens. Um, Habitat works both in Australia um, as well as overseas, and, and our office supports countries throughout Asia. And I want to focus, I guess, particularly in Asia, because that is certainly the front line. Um, it is really hard to est underestimate um, what urbanisation <coughs> is doing in terms of uh, how not-for-profits operate, really. You're getting um, a, a huge surge of people from rural areas into cities. In fact, uh, and we've heard some figures, and no doubt we'll hear a lot more, it's, uh, when we looked at it, it's uh, two people a second are moving into a city in Asia. And from a housing point of view, that means that in Asia alone, there's a shortage of 20,000 houses a day. So people are moving into areas, they're moving without housing, they're moving into slums. Um, and really, uh, it, it obviously, it just um, completely undermines sustainability and, and the whole pressure that's on a city. So, so it's... And I guess the other thing that's really interesting from a not-for-profit perspective, be it World Vision, be it Habitat for Humanity, for the last 50 years we've been focused in rural areas because um, most poor people, historically, the poorest people were in, say, a landlocked country in Africa, possibly suffering from famine. Now most poor people are going to be in urban populations. And we uh, are really, I guess, as a whole sector, trying to scramble to work out what the best thing to do is. Um, I think one of the most fundamental things that are really important in trying to bring people, uh, to give them equity, give them an involvement, um, is land tenure. Uh, something like 80% mm. of the world's population don't have secure land tenure. We take it for, for granted that when we can actually afford a house or we sign a, a lease, that we have some kind of security. But for most people in the world, that's not the case. And in cities, the ability um, or the, the occurrence of when people get forced off their land um, particularly as land values increase, is quite extraordinary. Um, I was in Curzon City recently, met a lady um, who, her family lived in their ancestral home uh, with three generations, so they'd been in the home for 50 years, and then one day armed police turned up uh, and bulldozed the whole community. Uh, they were so poor that they actually had to live in the ruins of their house for the next two years while they waited for government to supply some land, and then um, Ironically, when we look at corporates, uh, uh, it was a group of uh, corporate volunteers from Telstra who, through Habitat, came and uh, volunteered mm. and built a house for this lady uh, and, and her family. But it's pretty hard to imagine just how insecure land tenure can be for anyone. So finding ways through governments, uh, both uh, particularly at the local government level as well, um, to get land tenure to people is really incredibly important. And mm. particularly, as most people in urban areas are living in slums, uh, how we deal with slums and recognising that slums in some cases uh, need to exist rather than governments ignoring them and then trying to starve them of <coughs> resources. And there's a really fascinating debate around um, whether you can put streets into slums because people don't have addresses. There's no access for, um, for emergency vehicles. Uh, when you get a fire, um, you know, the, the damage is immense. So uh, slums are really, I guess, the front line in how we respond. Uh, We've had projects where, and slums are uh, these real um, contrasts. In some cases, they are amazing ecosystems where uh, entrepreneurs really flourish and you can get whatever you need. And we've got a, a case in Bangladesh where the community has come together because the government doesn't provide anything, so they're providing their own community-led uh, rubbish disposal service. Mm -hmm. And the rubbish, if it's not collected, uh, sits in the, uh, the water system, clogs the drains, and, uh, and people are subject to much more flooding. But the uh, ability of people to come together in community, as a few speakers have already said, is quite extraordinary. So that issue um, around uh, slums is important because on the flip side, the contrast is police won't go there, there's no necessary law and order, people aren't safe, 
there's all sorts of, um, of issues that are really critical. Oh, look, I think so, land tenure, um, working with slums, equipping local government particularly, in most cases local governments are the ones that have to do this work uh, because it is around planning, it's around equipping uh, authorities and yet most often uh, they're the ones that are least equipped. So I think that's, that's been a, a huge blockage in the past. Uh, I think the other thing really is scale. Um, we, Habitat for Humanity has been around 40 years. We've built, I think, something like a, a million houses. Um, but that's just going to be a drop in the ocean. So uh, in the Asia um, area, in the next uh, five years, we're looking to build 15 million houses. And we've realised we've got to do it differently. We can't just take a dollar from one country and go and build in the next country. We have to find ways to really add scale. One of the, the key ways we're looking at doing it is to work with microfinance organisations mm. to allow them to have the products to lend for housing. Because most microfinance has been for enterprise. Mm. Uh, mm. People might get a sewing machine or something to, to get their business. And the thinking is that creates in income and they can repay the loan. But if we can equip people to improve their houses, um, and people do it incrementally in, in many poor countries, uh, people's health are better, their productivity is better, and they can pay it back. And that potentially can unleash uh, millions and millions of dollars. Because when you look at, uh, I guess, the housing market in a country like Cambodia, uh, there's normally two or three key blockages, and, and access to finance is one. Uh, the other is access to cheap, reliable materials and also then access to skilled tradespeople. And in Cambodia, we're looking at the supply chain to work out how we can tackle those three issues. And I've mentioned microfinance. We're working with Borrel at the moment, or pitching a, a, a program to Borrel where we'll go in and help set up the first nationally accredited training program for <laughs> construction workers or builders. Mm -hmm. And then, so they don't get um, pinched by the private sector and, uh, and, and don't serve the local community. We're looking at trying to micro-franchise -fran that. To, to set them up with their own business so they'll stay um, and then also provide materials. Um, but we're really going to have to look at bringing scale in a whole new way. It's really hard, as I said before, <coughs> to underestimate the challenge. Pretty much if you're looking at poverty and development, uh, it's going to be the biggest challenge of the 21st century and we really significantly need to change the way we do it. And as we've already <laughs> seen here, we need to do it through multiple partners. Um, we need to have business, we need to have government. So there's talk now We've always had PPPs, um, private-public partnerships. There's now, uh, they're trying to add an extra P, which I'm in favour of, which is people. Mm -hmm. And the idea that not-for-profits have a role, uh, in community-based organisations have a role, that if there's a big infrastructure project and a community is impacted, to work with that community, to actually involve them. Uh, we did some research recently that said uh, in the urban space, the World Bank and, and some of the big development banks are really the biggest spenders, and most of them are infrastructure projects. And by their own figuring, something like 30% of them, those projects fail because they haven't involved the community enough. And there's a real power as well as a real saving <laughs> in mobilising the community to have them involved in those projects, to have them maintaining projects. And that will certainly be the way of the future. And I think from a pure business perspective, to be able to provide safe, cheap, affordable housing in the Asia-Pacific region um, is a huge investment opportunity for companies in Australia. Uh, and, uh, but it's a matter of doing it effectively. So I think uh, to have government frameworks, to have meetings like this where we're thinking about how to develop cities, how to respond to the housing crisis is really critical. So happy to be here and looking forward to, to the discussion. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, again, highlighting those, those challenges, both the practical challenges of um, finances, skills, resources, uh, the scale challenges, but again highlighting the potential outcome. People coming together in homes for a meal to have a voice and to have rights. Um, it's, it's the direction in the future. Um, we've heard some, some wonderful narratives, um, but narratives are only as powerful as the pathways which communicate them. Um, so. It's now great um, that we can hear from John Watson, um, who's the city editor with uh, the conversation, uh, to hear a bit about what is the role of uh, the media, what are the challenges that the media face um, in progressing and bringing forward this ethical cities debate uh, into mainstream. Please, Thank John. Uh, firstly, I must say I feel a bit 
odd being a representative of the media in Australia because I'm pretty sure I'm not a very typical representative. <laughs> uh, I'll, back, I'll give you my background first. Um, I actually lived and studied as a journalist in South Africa and I'm about to go and start working as a journalist and I had my residence terminated and had to return to Australia. But it uh, created a completely different perspective on, um, I, I guess, the... Most journalists have some element of social advocacy in their makeup uh, when they go into journalism, but for me it became very much stronger as a result of my experience living in a, another country that was just so much less advantaged in so many ways. Uh, but at the same time, I would also say it was so much better at tapping into its own strengths and resources to make a difference, make a change happen. Uh, so I brought that to Australia. I worked in a regional, uh, at a regional newspaper, the Latrobe Valley Express, for half a dozen years. That period coincided with the quite systematic dismantling of the SEC, the old public service ethos of it, the uh, obligations to community that existed. Uh, it was corporatized. <coughs> The workforce of the Latrobe Valley power industry went from more than 20,000, finished up at somewhere around 2,000, 3,000, I guess. Uh, and the community was devastated by it. Uh, then I ended up at The Age, where I spent 20 years. Um, I never intended to be there. Actually, I was at, in Geelong for a couple of years, so I had more regional city experience. And I still live in Geelong even after 20 years of working in Melbourne, and a big part of the reason is simply it still functions as a community. I can reasonably expect to walk down the street and see someone I know. Um, then I've been in Melbourne, working in Melbourne at the age for 20 years, um, and I still get startled when I see someone I know randomly walking down the street. Um, but. Uh, my wife would gently mock me about this because I was a chief editorial, chief leader writer for The Age, so the daily editorial, I wrote that. And she says, you're writing about a city and you don't even feel remotely part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but she also actually, the other, the other aspect that she mocked was, she says, you know what you do? You write secular sermons. <laughs> because, <laughs> because of all the elements of a newspaper, the one aspect about what should be, what needs to be done, what is the right thing to do, the daily editorial mm. is that. Yeah. Um, and from that perspective, um, that is, for an for a, a so, a ethically motivated journalist, that is one of the most satisfying and most frustrating things to do all at once. Um, because for a start, you soon become aware that only a very small section of the audience actually reads those things diligently. Mm. And at the same time, that's your most influential movers and shakers. It, you could see it have an effect sometimes because the consolation the editor would always offer me is, oh, well, the people that matter are reading it, John. Which always created a real feeling of conflict in me because I didn't write for a certain section of people that mattered. In my mind, actually, the people who mattered most were the ones who were disadvantaged. Um, anyway, then we've had a period of quite dramatic disruption and, well, verging on chaos in the media and especially in the newspaper industry. And the period where journalists who had, I guess, ethical motivations could find a place to write, somewhere to put it in the paper and an audience to read it, that was a golden age that is now gone. Um, the, 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 the old wall that existed between the commercial concerns of the, the publisher and the journalists has, has vanished. So journalists used to say, be able to say, look, this is important. I'm going to write about it. I don't care if anybody reads it. I'm going to write about it because it's got to get out there. Now we're in an age of extraordinary cost-cutting. And it co coincides with the digital rev <coughs> excuse me, the digital... Oh. I've actually also got this frog in my throat from travelling on a train every day. 
<coughs> so we've had the, the revolution of technology and it's transformed the way people provide information and the way they consume it. And the newspapers bore the brunt of it. They had journalists were expensive in their view. They filled the space between the ads and the ads were disappearing. So the journalists would disappear at quite a rate too. And then came the technology that enabled you to know exactly who was reading what. And today you have the situation where journalists' KPIs explicitly include how many people are reading each of their articles and they have to account for why are you not reading, producing articles that are better read. Same goes, television ratings has been the case for much longer. And it's no coincidence or accident that television, uh, there's far less of what you would uh, recognise as respectable current affairs, serious journalism, because their rating is driven. And this is where you come to what I would call the kind of horror of contemporary journalism. We always suspected that the kind of stories about things that are important, the things that we want to change, making the world a better place, we always suspected that they struggled for an audience, but we did them anyway. Now we get the figures, the daily data, and it's no longer a quarterly circulation figure that goes to the advertisers, it's the daily feedback. They can see what's being read as it's being read, and they won't advertise with you if you're not being read. And that data shows, I think, something that's profoundly damning about us as consumers of news media. Um, I tend to sum it up as, if it's about others, we're not interested. And others are foreigners, <coughs> the dispossessed, indigenous, the homeless, the unemployed, youth generally. All those categories do very badly. Um, and I'd argued until I was blue in the face for years that we should be doing more articles on those issues. But the numbers say that even when we do those stories, the audience is small. So there's a small core of concerned people who feel it's their obligation to be informed, who read those, but in a very much more brutal and ruthless industry, those stories become harder and harder to justify the cost of somebody actually going out and doing them. So that's how I ended up leaving Fairfax because I was actually about to leave journalism uh, and, the redundant, and I watched a whole, whole room full of people disappear who were basically the people I respected as journalists who wrote serious, issue, serious stories about serious issues about the need for change. They couldn't find a place for their work anymore. They felt unloved. So I eventually left. Um, as it happened, then the founder and managing editor of the conversation uh, got wind of the redundancy round coming and contacted me out of the blue and said, I would, would I be interested in joining them? The conversation uh, essentially is founded on a, on a very simple but very brilliant idea that in a world full of huge challenges and complex problems, wicked problems, there's something faintly ludicrous about a journalist knowing nothing about the subject in the morning, going out, rushing for a few hours to try and find out as much as they can, writing up a story that neatly and clearly explains that very, very complicated problem in a way that's understandable to a member of the public who hasn't been paying much attention until now to that issue. Uh, the proposition is that academics who have been studying this actually have a great depth of knowledge that they can bring to bear, they can come to a report and they're familiar with all the concepts in it and they can analyse it or they can come to an issue or a daily policy debate, whatever's come up in the news and they bring a whole background to it. Now, I hope I'm not insulting too many people but a lot of academics are pretty terrible communicators in terms of communicating with someone who hasn't got a tertiary education or hasn't been studying that subject. So our job as journalists is to take their initial go at boiling down the issue, 
and turning it into, we aim for somebody who's got a, a, a year 10 education, can read it and understand it, um, which is sometimes traumatic for the academic. <laughs> but I think it's, um, <coughs> the point about it is it aims to be as broad and as inclusive as any journalism can be on complicated big issues of the day. So, and it has, um, mm -hmm. now one other side, I, I used to wonder as a professional paid journalist, I used to wonder about the ethics of having unpaid, relying purely on the unpaid writing of academics. Um, I've come to realise that actually they get um, quite a fair deal out of it. it it's more than repays its um, effort in terms of finding an audience and getting a tremendously responsive uh, feedback, research partnerships, all kinds of things. Um, it turns out this is a, as engaged an audience as any other I've ever worked with. Mm. Now the problem is though, that if we've got a proposition here, that we've got a series of ethical goals that we want to achieve, and we're agreed on what those are. And in fact, I mean, it's the things we teach our children. You know, care, share, and then promptly, once they get to about high school, we tell them, now forget all that, go out and compete for all you're worth. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a very individualistic society. But essentially those goals are things we can all agree on in the abstract. But having those goals and having those messages you want to communicate is now much more challenging to go out and communicate them because there is no monolithic media to go out and say, well, if we can get them to run our press releases or we can get an interview on TV, we've got the audience. Because the audience is absolutely fragmented and fractured. We no longer say, well, if you've got the, the morning newspaper, which pe people read almost out of obligation, the daily news radio, and the evening TV, we've got the bases covered. That's only a minority of people now rely on those for their sources of information. Uh, especially if we're talking about the marginalised, we're then into another area of difficulty when we, all our assumptions about the smart city are that people are connected. Mm. The problem is, if you're marginalised, even most homeless people actually <coughs> have a handset, a digital handset, but they're constantly running out of credit. They're constantly finding difficulty getting access to, you know, who's got an ISP if you can't pay them? Um, and then the young people who we want to include, well, most of them don't read newspapers. Most of them don't watch television news. Most of them don't actually use the conventional means of consuming news at all. They rely on social media. That's their primary source of news and information. And at that stage, you want to say, well, you know, if you want to try and manage social media, good luck to you. Uh, it's, it just makes communicating these goals and these messages so much more difficult. Um, okay, I'll just finish up by saying that. So that's, that's the kind of horror story perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we are in a world where, because of the commercial imperatives, the media are, if they're honest with themselves, so much more just about entertainment and clickbait. What's going to pique the interest? What's going to amuse people? What's going to distract them for a moment from the, from the world? When in fact, what we want to do is quite the opposite. We want to engage them with the real issues of the world. Um, and we've got a situation which a recent survey said of Australian journalists found only 30% or so from memory mm. thought their role was social advocacy, which I would imagine is some kind of historic low. Um, Historically, most journalists, their ideal was to go out and make a difference for the better in the world. But then I'll go back to South Africa. And um, I was also engaged in student politics there. And, you know, at the, and this was in the early 80s, late, early 80s. And so peak of apartheid, peak of paranoia too. Um, and if they could manage to organise, communicate, engage, uh, and bring about change in those circumstances, well, then surely, despite all those challenges of communication in a country like this, we, we surely can too. 
And the fact is that the other positive I see is that we have a generation growing up now that no longer thinks in terms of neatly quarantined borders, which I actually think of national borders as, as excuses that, that quarantine us from our responsibilities for the world. Um, whereas young people tend to think more naturally, once you're, on, once you're on the internet and you've got friends overseas you've never met but you still know them well, it's that much harder to, to quarantine yourself. And they are, I don't actually have a bloody clue about how you manage a, a media campaign in that world. But the fact is that those global connections are already in place. Um, and young people are, no question they've given up on formal politics as we know it. They, they, but they are intensely political. They're on the wrong end of, of um, developments in this country. Their, their work is so precarious. They study hard. They do all the right things. They come out to crappy, casual jobs. Uh, they are more open to change. Um, and the, the issue is that they're, the old media are at the intersection of political and economic power and influence. And um, I, I was glad to to hear Tim Costello make the point that it's actually very hard to get a hearing for what might be common prescriptions of decency and, and, and ethical behaviour, but they're pre presented as radical. They're seen as radical and threatening. And um, mm. even something like um, you know, coffee in Melbourne, the lifeblood of Melbourne, you know, we are inextricably linked to the disaster at the under end, other end of that supply chain if we don't question where that coffee came from and how it was produced. And the fact is, in media terms, we have the capacity to find out about it better than ever before. So we cannot just rely on the mm. old media to do that for us. We, we actually have the means, in a way that we never did before, to use the media for our own ends. And I, I think that's, I guess, the main message that I've got in the end is that um, the media is what we make of it these days. Very interesting. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John, for again highlighting both the challenges but also the opportunities um, of modern media. Um, we've got uh, 20 or 25 minutes before we'll break for lunch, um, but now I really wanted to open it up um, for questions um, from anyone in the audience. Um, so what we'll maybe do is we'll aim to take three questions um, and then let the panellists ref um, reflect on those three questions. Um, we should have a roving mic. Uh, there's a gentleman up by the camera in the white shirt. And another lady in up the back and then this gentleman in the aisle here. So we'll take three questions. Please just introduce yourself um, first. Thank you. So it's David Mitchell from RMIT, and I do research into land tenure and informal settlement. So I was very glad <coughs> to hear Martin talk about um, the problem of land tenure, and also link it to evictions. Um, if we're talking about inclusiveness, I think how, how can we be inclusive without addressing those 80% that you mentioned who, who don't have formal tenure? But I'd just like to raise one more dimension to it, and that's that these people often don't have a formal record a government record, so they're excluded from government programs and services. Mm -hmm. And also, if there's a, a, a flood, for example, they often are the most affected, but they don't get compensation in the programs. So I wonder if you could comment more on that. Great. Uh, Austin Lee. The city of Melbourne. Um, Tim Costello in this morning's address talked about um, everyone being in the in the theatre watching the um, screen and walking out of the theatre with a, a different perspective on what was on the screen. Um, but I think what uh, happens quite often is that there are the vast majority of people aren't even in the theatre to start with which goes to, um, John, your point about the disengagement. And I'm just wondering, my question is to the panel, how can the 
uh, Global Cities program actually start to address that particular point? Can you, through the corporate social responsibility and adding in individuals' social responsibility, the four Ps, how can you actually start to turn people's attention to some of these problems of a broader nature? Great. And finally, hand up the back. Hi, my name is Pamela Sitko and I'm here from World Vision International. Thank you very much. I was thinking about what was not said just now. And the trend that came to my mind was urban displacement. <coughs> we're thinking about refugees, we're thinking about population movements, especially in Europe and the Syria-affected countries. So the question I have um, is really around, well, maybe the private sector and housing. What, what can we do, what should we do when we're thinking about ethical cities in terms of working with the private sector and in terms of housing uh, refugees? Thank you. Great, thank you for those uh, three questions. Um, I'll now open it up. Um, maybe Martin, it might set, make sense for you to begin with the first Sure, question. so I think the first question I think was looking at um, uh, to some extent, unless I'm boiling it down wrong, advocacy and the rights of those that are displaced and how we give them a voice to some extent. Am I right in understanding the question? Uh, in terms of uh, tenure, they don't have formal tenure. Yeah, tenure, they don't yeah exactly. Um, look, I think uh, it, it's a really uh, good question and serious <coughs> point. I think there's a couple of things. I know um, Habitat in the region looked at a whole range of tenure solutions. So to actually go to an end point where it's full land tenure and title, as we understand it, uh, may be too far in many countries, but there are all sorts of gradients of that. And I know in places like Cambodia, I think they have what they call soft tenure. So I think for governments to develop some of those alternatives as they go up through the chain of security. I think though that um, there has been real power proved in just communities coming together in whatever situation they have. Uh, you know, uh, I think the slum dweller communities, uh, which is probably a terrible phrase, but that have really exercised um, really unique uh, advocacy power in pressuring governments quite successfully and mobilising quite well. One of the things I think uh, NGOs need to do, uh, and I know World Vision and Habitat does it, is not go into a community and say, okay, what's wrong with the place, how can we help? Mm -hmm. but to actually go in in a positive sense that says, okay, well, what works in this community? What, it, what's the real value of the community? What, uh, how, you know, what holds it together and what are its strengths? And how can we build on that to then tackle opportunities? And I know in terms of some of the programs uh, that, uh, that some not-for-profits um, uh, do, which is basically community-led advocacy. So you're helping them mobilise communities to actually hold their local governments accountable. And what has been ironic, uh, from what I've seen in countries, I know World Vision Door program in India, where even when you have corruption at every level of government, um, it seems that you can pressure at least one level, and then their boss doesn't see why the person lower than them should be corrupt, even though they are. And it's actually freed up, whether it's things like lunch money, there's, there's all sorts of um, legislation and protection that are really good in a lot of countries, particularly in relation to housing, um, and uh, the provision of land, but it's not, it's either um, willfully not enforced or it's not resourced. So I think to be able to leverage um, those things is really important. I know we're doing a project in the Philippines where we're actually trying to support the government in, uh, in putting together community groups to actually help them enforce land rights issues. That the laws already exist, it's not a policy issue, it's a resource, and I guess it's government that are either uh, unwilling or unable, and I think that's a, a big challenge. It's often finding the hook that can get you into communities. Um, I worked on issues like HIV and AIDS and suddenly housing became an issue in a community that had um, insecure tenure. But it was uh, the prostitutes collective, the women's collective that actually knew where the wider families were, where they'd dispersed, how we could find them and actually how we could rehouse. And so it's working through that informal sector is so much more powerful than working through the local government sector. Uh, in New Zealand, we're very lucky um, with multiply owned land. We've got a Minister of Economic Development who's also a Minister of Māori Affairs that's just opened up 
the discussion about multiple owned land and how we can develop for community housing and uh, that's a great discussion that we're having in New Zealand now but we're lucky because we've, we can easily find these people. But in developing countries, I always used to hook into uh, the collectives that were working in villages, and boy, they knew where everybody was. Mm. And, um, but we always tended in the past to go to local government rather through, than through ADRA or um, the women's collectives, who are very, very powerful then at changing the message back <coughs> to government. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, and I think maybe, Doug, did you have a, a quick comment? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> as you, so moving out of my youth hat into the other parts of UN Habitat, one, we have a program called the Global Land Tool Network, and we kind of look at a continuum of land rights, where you have the more formal people holding tenure, and then you go all the way through to just informal, more traditional ways of doing it. And just from our perspective, it's more an asset-based, like not assets as in owning assets, but in the sense of the what the community already has on the ground and then trying to build from there. For example, on the youth side, we had it ran a youth and land project where we took five countries, Yemen, Nepal, Kenya, Brazil, and one, Zimbabwe. And we compared all the, and we trained all these young people in different techniques. For example, one of the things young people do globally really is pick up on technology. So we work with a group called Spatial Collective in uh, Nairobi and they're doing mapping and it's some amazing mapping that we're training young people to do on the ground in the slums, and then suddenly they own the knowledge and they own what's going on. So it really is, you wanna be, not, you wanna be flexible but not too flexible, mm. yet on the other hand, you wanna build from what's there because if you come in and think you're just gonna all ha suddenly have everyone have tenure, you're hooped, it's not gonna happen. So that's kind of the perspective mm. we've come from. Great, thank you. Ma maybe moving on to the second question, uh, which was around uh, disengagement and how we can better um, address uh, that issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll have a go if you like. I mean, um, I'm, I'm probably not qualified to, but I'll say something anyway. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mean, certainly, I think as as a academic, and I'll sometimes contributed to the conversation. Thank you, John, for being gentle with me as a uh, uh, on the editorial side. I think. Um, uh, this question of engagement um, obviously intersects with exactly the comments that John made about um, about social media and about the um, the current state of play as it as it is um, as regards uh, our various methods of communication and media and messaging um, that we have globally, um, and and also of course the fundamental question of politics engagement in policy making engagement in 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 in, in if you like. Um, the distribution of resources. Um, so these these two, I think, um, clash in a way um, um, with this um, question that we've been and, and Tim brought it up this morning, and we've been brought, brought up on several times already, um, which is in a, in, a, in a sense uh, the tension between the rights of the individual and and the identity of the individual, and the rights of us and and, and the identity of us as a collective. Um, so I, I think I think engagement. I think about the the possibilities, um, and and I don't think the, the the game is up. I don't think we're in a position where we are um, <coughs> we, we are, um, if you like, permanently in a in a um, in an era uh, going into the foreseeable future where the rights of the individual are paramount and where engagement of the dispossessed and the uh, and the um, disempowered uh, is set. Uh, I do believe it's open. Uh, um, one example I would give, um, I guess, would be, in fact, it came out of housing um, activism um, <coughs> and involved a lot of social media organisations, and that would be the election of Ada Kalau uh, as the mayor of Barcelona uh, only last year, um, where, as a result of austerity in uh, post-GFC Spain and, and Catalonia and Barcelona specifically, where there were mass evictions of uh, people who were in finding themselves um, with their families pushed out of their homes. Um, what, what happened was there were, were a range of groups that coordinated together around housing activism, getting access to housing uh, in Barcelona. Um, lo I mean, the, 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 um, the situation was one where uh, there was, of course, very um, <coughs> low occupancy rates. 
Uh, there were lots of houses empty and a lot of people without housing. So um, it made sense. Um, and through that movement, um, we now have an activist, in effect, an activist turned mayor uh, in, in Barcelona. And I, I think that's just one example, and there, there's a lot behind that, of the politics of possibility um, today. And I think, I think that we, we can think about, and it's in fact important for us to think about, uh, engagement of, of the disengaged and dispossessed, and, um, uh, and, and doing that in a modern um, conversation around the future of, of cities. So mm. that would be my comment. Yeah, if I may just try to um, on. Hello. Speaking. Um, <laughs> here we go. Um, so try to align uh, or bring together a few things. So Austin's question about sort of again about that public interest and how do you create it? Also Pamela's uh, about sort of the re refugees and and you finished with and what is the role of the private sector in, in addressing uh, the challenges there? Um, Ralph opened the conference by sort of just reminding everybody that every city is necessarily unique and so forth. And in the same way, while we talk about the private sector, the business sector and so forth, every business is also has its own yeah. peculiarities and, and un uniquenesses. So um, businesses also, as I was saying, are a part of society and reflect society. So there are things that um, we also make generalizations about people. And so on the one hand, you know, we talk about, you know, oh, well, you know, the people aren't engaged enough. And, you know, the youth of today and, and so forth, and they're not reading the right articles. But actually, if I talk with Volunteering Victoria, which I do fairly often, they say that the interest in volunteering among people under 24 is absolutely huge. But they just don't want to do it if it means every Tuesday night and every Saturday, but they will do three months at a time when they're between jobs and so forth. So it's about how do we change our society to actually evolve in ways that allows us as a collective to best meet each other's needs. So I think that's part of it. At the same time, you also have to take a look at the business model. And just as John was talking about, you know, the challenge in the media where it has all become about actually uh, why is it that um, so much of it is about ratings and so forth is because of principally in certainly in Australia and many Western economies, um, and it's interesting, we tend to talk about economies that it also gives a sort of indication of, of where our, our collective minds are at. Um, so I'll say societies. Um, you know, again, the media is increasingly controlled by, uh, by the corporations and, and actually the ABCs of this world find themselves also having to compete because otherwise how do they have relevance if nobody's listening or reading or watching, etc. So to then jump to Pamela's bit, I mean, there are examples. IKEA in, in uh, Sweden has been doing, has been building flat pack uh, housing to accommodate refugees. So it's not that um, companies are, are doing nothing, but equally, if the prevailing mood in Scandinavia and Sweden specifically is to go, you know what, we used to think we were quite an open society, but actually faced with the realities of, of what real immigration looks like actually we quite liked being six foot and blonde and we think we'd like to stick to that, um, then, uh, then, then it doesn't matter in a sense, not that it doesn't matter, but IKEA's ability to really uh, meet that social need is a challenge. And my final point, because I think all of these things are non-linear and interwoven, is that companies, as I, going back to the beginning, exist within uh, the context of the society. So actually, if you take a look at the whole development of the modern form of corporate responsibility, I do say the modern form, it's existed really since the Industrial Revolution in many different ways. Um, but uh, it was profoundly driven, and, and they actually, <laughs> I'm not sure if getting credit is the right phrase, but anyway, Shell, the large global oil corp corporation, um, has played a profound role in dragging the corporate sector forwards in terms of uh, the, the, the development of, the, the, they played a real role in the UN Global Compact for Business piece with the development of the UN uh, Global, uh, sorry, the, the UN uh, Business and Human, Human Rights Framework and also in the Corporate Responsibility Reporting Agenda. Now, why did they do that? Well, because they decided to sink an oil platform in the North Sea and there were a group of uh, environmental activists who said that they thought that was probably a bad idea. And uh, tragically as well, they were associated with the hanging of the activist Ken Sarawiwa in uh, West Africa in uh, 1998. And so, you know, again, it was, it was the public's pressure on, on Shell that has then given them uh, a, 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 you know, a, a, a platform, wrong phrase given the 
Brent's bar a bit, but anyway, uh, to, to, to actually show leadership. So it's not a, it's, none of this is sort of, there's no easy answer and there's not a, a single point. But again, I think uh, if you come back to my starting point that cities exist because of and for people, it comes down to what we as people are prepared to make others do. Yeah. Mm. I've been incredibly impressed walking around the streets of Melbourne to look at posters stuck on walls about, I'm a real Australian, we welcome you here. Um, that to me is saying it's public messaging in a different place. It's not in the media, but the public is rising up and saying we've got to be more humane about displaced people of the world. And, and I can see it very visibly here. I don't in our own country because boat people don't make it, quite frankly. Mm. But um, we, we have got um, refugee quotas that we're quite proud of, and mm. they're a drop in the ocean. But I see a rising up here, much more mm. visually, powerfully, about we've got to do our part. And that social messaging on mm. buildings and uh, graffiti and those other messaging means is, is very, very powerful to press your triggers about are we thinking enough <coughs> about inclusivity. And, um, and I think the old paradigms of, for us, especially in local government, to excite the public, don't come to a council meeting, <laughs> um, I would say, quite frankly. But we do now video and um, have our own live site. And I'm amazed at the number of people who love to watch meetings in their own home and interact on our, our social media site. Um, and then when there is an issue, boy, it comes out. And one of the most exciting issues I've seen was doing a round of community gardens and I took a photo with the Cook Island ministers in the middle of the garden and, and um, people around us and it had more hits than any other um, Facebook page that I've put on my website and I, I found that incredibly exciting. So the people are there, just a different message gets them out and presses different buttons. So you've got to have an incredibly complex communications strategy to connect at all levels. And that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I don't Twitter, I just don't get time. <laughs> <laughs> and a quick comment from Dr. Um Yeah, just three really quick points. On messaging, I, I mean, um, taking off my UN hat, I'm from Canada. We had 10 years of desolation and wasteland in the sense of engagement from the Canadian government. And then suddenly within, you know, it turns around and immediately we have our prime minister mm. greeting Syrian refugees as they're coming in the door. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. you, it's, people are engaged. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into, and the, the messaging is so critical. And you also see, that, and again, coming from a North American context, what's happening in the United States. You have like these extremes of one person who's like a socialist in the US context versus, you know, some right wing loony. And <laughs> you have, um, and again, it's, it, the messaging is there and people want to listen, they really do. And, and just to go back as the, the, he's talking about youth volunteerism and stuff, I fundamentally disagree when someone says that youth are disengaged. I do not find that, I have not found that in 20 years. They engage <coughs> differently and it's not, our, their, not their responsibility to engage always in our processes. It's our responsibility to engage them and find out where they're engaging. The young, so we have, a, for example, in, just in the developing world, we have a, what we call an urban youth fund. We fund, funded 300 youth-led organizations mm -hmm. over the past five years. Every year, with no, um, no media budget mm -hmm. at all, we get 8,000 youth-led organizations that hit our city, and we fund 0.001% of them. Mm -hmm. There is no development funding, or has not been any development funding <coughs> for youth. Youth have been as cities, no, not a target at all. Mm. So I mean, we have to, so when we're coming back to ethics, one of the, the pr principal ethical issues we have to say, is, are young people capable? And we also have to be really practical because if we don't feel they're capable, then we're really just writing off the developing world, which is 70 to 80% under the age of 30. If you don't engage young people, just as if you didn't engage women back in, um, we know that that just doesn't work. You can't do it. You cannot um, expect to make, it, make a change. And then the last piece is on local government and the question about um, what we're doing about 
uh, refugees coming in and stuff. There's a program that we've put together with a couple other UN agencies called Haven Cities, which is basically, again, modeling or saying that local government plays a critical role. Local government is where these, young, <coughs> these people come in. In Turkey, there's two million or so, about four months ago, there was two million or so um, refugees. 600,000 were in camps. 1.4 million were in cities and towns. Go to Istanbul right now. When you went to Istanbul three, four years ago, there were the Rom, the gypsies, that's where you saw it. They're completely displaced. It's all Syrian refugees. And the people responding in, in Istanbul, too, the Istanbul Metropolitan Council and the Youth Council, who, ha who are spending millions of dollars deal dealing with this, but they don't get recognition as, a, as a, a very functional place. So the Haven City idea is to basically find the best practices across Europe and say, what are the, how do we model these best practices? We need to look. And from a youth perspective, the mass major vast majority of these people coming across the borders are young people and often young men. If we don't have programs tailored to them as youth, <coughs> as a demographic, it isn't going to work. You have to look at how they, what they do re recreation-wise. You need to look at what they need around livelihood training. You need to look at what they need around education. A lot of young people's education has stopped. And you see what's happening in places like Somalia, where if it stops for a generation, it's really hard to get back. So you need to look at these, these processes, and we need to model them and replicate them and push them up. Great. Well, uh, time has got away from us, and we're about to break for lunch. But before we do, um, we're speaking about the importance of messaging. Uh, if <coughs> anyone here is on social media and has a nugget of gold of you know, 120 characters or whatever the Twitter limit is, um, if you're on Twitter, it would be great to um, be hashtagging with ethical cities, um, highlights and reflections from this morning's sessions. <laughs> And, and um, <laughs> after, after lunch, yeah, which will be one, uh, meeting back here at, at one o'clock, um, we will be um, having the joy of hearing like from the Honourable Lord Mayor of Melbourne. Has to do with the way we, we Thank you. Apologies to anyone who froze in, during the last session. It was quite cool. Uh, that has been addressed, as all things are. So this session should be a little bit more warmer. Not to say that the last session wasn't full of warmth. <laughs> what we have now, uh, and, and before I uh, introduce the, the Lord Mayor, we have a, a, a video message from Porto Alegre, one of our cities in the cities program. Uh, in Brazil, you may not be aware of Porto Alegre, but it's made famous by its participatory budgeting uh, process. Um, uh, it's, it's also another one of the 100 resilient cities uh, under the pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, but it was also the first city that pioneered the Melbourne model, uh, which is the basis of the UN Global Compact Cities Program, having been created in Melbourne. Um, and the Melbourne model is about that collaboration between private sector, civil society and government for those global issues that can only be addressed at a local level with the right degree of collaboration. The, the project was um, uh, Villa Chocolatao, which was a resettlement of a whole community. Um, and it was an informal community. And it's taken up, a, and that was, um, it's probably been 10, 10 years to the day for the transition of that community into a, a full resettlement. And that is now a model that's being applied across um, Port Allegra. So we've got a, a brief video to uh, give you some of that context. Um, but there's a lot of work that's been done. And just as a, a further note, I'd like to um, uh, recognise Professor um, Gang Pan from the Research Centre of Eco Environmental Science Academy, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, uh, who, who's uh, uh, joined us today. So I'll, I'll start the, the video. Thank you. Uh, Caesar's done quite amazing things in his time uh, and, and the, the city itself has a long history and so we're very proud uh, to have them as members of our network. Without um, further ado, I'll, I'll just introduce uh, Robert Doyle, Lord Mayor of Melbourne, the City of Melbourne. 
Uh, he was elected in 2008 and 2012 and is the serving Lord Mayor of Melbourne. He is the principal at the NAUS Group and management consultancy based in Melbourne and since 2007 has been the chairman of the Melbourne Health, the Royal Melbourne uh, Hospital and is the president of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Fund. Chairman of the Royal Melbourne Hospital Foundation and, and a trustee to the Shrine of Remembrance and a board member of the Plumbing Industry for Climate Action. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to come today and to talk to us about uh, ethical cities and, and of course Melbourne being a, a champion within that. Thank you. Thank you for doing me the courtesy of not laughing when Michael announced that I'm on the board of the Plumbing Industry Climate Action Centre, because people usually do. The reason I am is because I'm very interested in training and delivering high level training. Uh, and that's what that centre does, uh, particularly around sustainability. And I'm pleased to tell you that we have just won the training provider of the year for Australia at that centre. So we're pretty pleased with that. Um, before I begin, as we always do, could I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today, the members of the Great Coolant Nation, and pay my deep personal respects to their elders past and present, and thank the elders, particularly those of the Wurundjeri, whose lands these are, for the work that they do throughout our community as we meet here today. Um, if you are visitors to, to our city, uh, we're a very young city, founded only in 1835, but we are very proud that our first peoples are the oldest continuous culture in the world, and we think it's appropriate to recognise that before we make presentations. Um, could I also acknowledge my colleague, Mayor Steve Chadwick from Rotorua. Uh, pleasure to have another Mayor here. Um, and to all of you, many, many friends that I, I have um, throughout this room, many of you that I've, I've met before. Anyone here from Sydney? <laughs> Seventh most livable city in the world. <laughs> so welcome to all of you visitors to the most livable city in the world. Number one city for five years in a row. That wasn't very kind for a leader of an ethical city, was it? But anyway, um, very interesting thing, and, I, and I'm glad that a, a couple of the representatives from the city of Melbourne are here today, and I'll embarrass them by mentioning them later. Uh, yesterday, I released our clue data. We do a census of land use and employment. We do it every two years. We speak face to face with businesses throughout the municipality, and we gather very valuable data. I, I firmly believe in decision making that is based in good data. Um, my friend Mike Bloomberg, the ex-mayor of New York, has a great party trick. He, he pulls a dollar bill out of his pocket, that revered American greenback, and he kind of snaps it and he says, this is our greenback. On it, it says, in God we trust. And we do. The rest of you bring data. <laughs> and, and he means that. He means that if you want good public policy decision making, ethical public policy decision making, base it in good data. Because you can't fudge that. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that. I mean, the, the good part for us is, and, and you know, when you hear of people making decisions that bring electricity and water and sanitation to their people, you recognise the scale of problems that, that we face here is completely different. So I'm not going to pretend that, that our decision making processes are based in the necessities of life like that. But that clue data does show us something important. Another little anecdote before I, I sort of go on is something you might not know about, and we are a very affluent city. Um, we have a flag at the city of Melbourne. You might not know that, but we do. Uh, it sits on the front of my car. Can I recommend you get a flag on the front of your car? You can buy them really cheaply at you know, Arthur Daly's or somewhere. You turn up somewhere and people think, I've got no idea who he is, but he's got a flag on his car. Yeah, take the Prime Minister's spot. Would you? So I just recommend it to you. But on that flag, on that flag, it has four quadrants. It has an ox, a fleece, a whale, and a sailing ship primary production and the means of communication with the world when we were founded and the source of our original prosperity. Wander around this great city and you see the bones of that beautiful Victorian architecture that was built on gold pouring out of Ballarat and Bendigo, the second wave of our prosperity. The third wave of course comes in the 1920s when we discover plentiful, dirty but cheap brown coal in the Latrobe Valley and our manufacturing sector drives the prosperity. Well, in 2016, 2017, the car industry is going to exit our city, our, our, our state, and that will be the loss of 24,600 jobs, a tragedy for many of those people who may not work again. The interesting part, though, if I'm to look at the next wave of prosperity and what that means for the city, 
we can look at that crew data and know where the jobs are being created. And we know over the last 10 years, this city, I was just talking about now the 38 square kilometres that makes up the centre of the greater metropolis, has added 111,000 new jobs. And they're in professional services, they're in biotech, they're in clean tech, they're in health services, they're in education services. In other words, the shift now is to the knowledge economy and, and having that drive the prosperity of the city. And that will have profound effects on things like the decision making of the city. You can already see it, for instance, in the construction boom, not lauded by all, that goes on around the city. Because what's being put up there are residential towers. Because knowledge sector workers tend to want to live close to where they work. The jobs are being created right here. You can buy an apartment for $500,000, $550,000. Very difficult to buy a suburban house for that anywhere near the city of Melbourne. And, and so there's kind of a circle. I'm not sure yet whether it's a virtuous circle or not, but that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. I would say, though, that one of the things that I've learned since coming to the city of Melbourne, remember my background was also state government. I was in the state parliament for 14 years, and I'm going to make some comparisons of the two methods of decision making. At, at the city of Melbourne, we're very proud that we've been awarded both the IAP2, Australasian and International Core Values Award for Organisation of the Year, and the judges in awarding us that said about us, the City of Melbourne is clearly an organisation where leading edge public participation practices are part of the way things are done. I was very proud of that statement. You know, because people often criticise us and say that is not the case, but to be evaluated in that way and win the Australasian and international awards for it, I think is particularly important. And what that brings me to is almost the, the central belief that I have about my view of urbanism. My view of urbanism very much born out of thinking of people like Professor Rob Adams uh, at the City of Melbourne, my friend Professor Ross Hanson as well, and some of the thinking and writing that, that she has done on this topic. And it clearly says cities are for people. When you are making decisions, make decisions for people. It sounds simple, doesn't it? it sounds really simple. Not quite so simple as I point out to you. But that's the interesting part, isn't it? They're not only places for people, cities should be shaped by those people. And what you've got to do is ask yourself, in what ways can we make that happen? And I'm going to give you a, a few examples. I, I do believe, by the way, in that, that cities for people philosophy. You know, but we're very lucky in Melbourne, but I mean, a lot of it is good fortune. If you think when this wonderful city was laid out in that self-orienting grid, Robert Hoddle ignored the politicians and did not build those streets 66 feet wide, he built them 99 feet wide. And so generations later, we can make footpaths that are eight metres wide, we can plant avenues of trees down those streets, we can make them more pedestrian friendly, we can make decisions about people that don't involve bringing cars into the centre of the city because I don't know a great city in the world that is actively trying to bring more cars into the centre. And so when you make those decisions for people, they can be a little uncomfortable. It was a little uncomfortable closing one lane of Prince's Bridge to, through traffic. It was a little uncomfortable when I first arrived at the city of Melbourne and we had to do something about Swanson Street and my first impulse was to open it to traffic and the urban planners convinced me to go the opposite way and close Swanson Street to private vehicles. As a result, in terms of pedestrianisation, that street is now busier than Regent Street in London, and rentals are rising because of the value of that footfall throughout the city. So, let me go back to that proposition that we need to give citizens uh, a role to play in the decisions that they take. We don't go quite as far, we haven't gone quite as far as the example that you have seen there, and, and without knowing their model, uh, I can see some concerns that I would have with it. But I do think we do have a role in bringing people together to help us make decisions. Local government's always traditionally regarded as the tier of government that's been closest to the people. And in my experience, working with federal governments, both in the private sector and in the public sector, being in state parliament and now being in local government, I think it's true. I think local government gives the highest expression to engagement with citizens around decision making. And in fact, I'll go even further and be somewhat critical. It seems to me these days that when state and federal governments decide they want to communicate with people, they do it by way of paid advertising. 
as a de facto consultation and a de facto engagement. That's not to say that state and federal governments don't do person-to-person -person consultation, they do. But I'm not sure that it is built into the fabric of their decision making in the same way it is in local government. I often find conversations with state and federal governments a bit one way. They kind of tell us what they're going to do. You know, if you can't stop me, I'm going to do awful, something awful to you by Friday. Um, and often you can't stop them. So you, you learn to work around that. But at local government, it becomes crucial. And I don't think it's an excuse, by the way, to say the scale of decisions is different at a local municipal level than at a, a sub-national or national level, and that's why it can't be done. I don't accept that. There's, it's true that the decisions are of a different scale. I'm not sure, therefore, the processes have to be completely different. So when we looked at the, the concept that was mentioned in the video about participatory democracy, this is how we went about it. I'm going to give you three examples, and this is the first of them. Um, we wanted to... Well, no, let, let me give you those, those three things. I'm going to talk about engaging individual citizens. I'm going to talk about engaging stakeholders. I'm going to talk about sharing and collaborating when you can't do things for yourself. First of all, we wanted to develop a new 10-year financial plan at the City of Melbourne. And we knew that all the people in the municipality would be affected by that plan. And we opened that up in the normal way we do through our digital platforms and 600 people participated in that online participatory budgeting tool. Or they attended workshops or discussion groups or pop-up events across Melbourne. But then we decided we'd go one step further. So we sent out 6,500 random letters to our uh, businesses and households and invited them to nominate to be part of a panel to help us form that 10-year plan. We, of those who accepted, not all did, we then engaged a particular company, New Democracy, to identify a panel of 43 members. And their professional task was to make sure that the demographic of those members was right. It reflected the city's demographic makeup in age, gender, location, and between residents and businesses. Interestingly, when they finished and they had those 43 people, 90% of them had never actively engaged with council. So we weren't dealing with the normal suspects, if you like, the squeaky wheels, but we provided them with all the same information that councillors would get in order to make a decision about a 10-year plan. And they told us some really interesting things. They told us to trade off higher rates for better infrastructure. They told us not to sell off our subsidiary companies, citywide and Queen Victoria Market. They told us to increase CBD footpath accessibility by increasing footpath width and ease of access. Now, we didn't hand that, they told us a whole lot of other things as well. We didn't hand the decisions over to them, but as it turned out, we accepted their recommendations and then we presented back to the many people who'd, who'd given us their time in order to tell them and, and show faith with them that we had taken this process very seriously. It was very honest engagement with citizens, even though we reserved the final decision to ourselves. The next one I'd give you, and this is real, I'll do this really quickly because I don't have as much time as I, I thought I'd keep rabbiting on and I shouldn't. Do you know you can get an awful lot done by just sitting down with the relevant stakeholders? You know, if, if you can put people of good heart and good intent around a table, they will come up with the answer for you. Probably, if, if you ask me what is the thing I'm most proud of in my time in public life, it's something that you wouldn't know. Uh, you probably wouldn't know that I did. Um, back in the 1990s, I was asked, because I was Parliamentary Secretary for Health at the time, I was asked to look at the trauma system throughout Victoria because, to be honest, it was fragmented and it was causing a lot of difficulty for our clinicians. You know, you're in a very serious car accident way out in the east of the state. You land at Sale Hospital, mm, too serious for us, so you're flown to Dandenong Hospital, mm, needs neurosurgery, you're flown in to the Alfred Hospital. And by that time, of course, the, the damage is, is significant. How could we organise trauma throughout the state so that people were moved in one move to the appropriate location for the appropriate treatment, regardless of the seriousness of the injury? It took two years of sitting down with a table, an unworkable table, I thought at the time, of about 34 different stakeholders. And, you know, if you think politicians have egos, try being in a room full of surgeons. <laughs> um, and, and all of the relevant stakeholders who all actually, most of them had something to lose, not gain. Because this was going to take work away from them, particularly high-end work. And I won't go into the politics of medicine, but that's not always well received. Nevertheless, with patient outcomes for patient-read citizen, 
with patient outcomes at the centre of what we were doing, we did decide on a trauma system which is centralised now with the paediatric centre at the Children's and the two adult centres at the Royal Melbourne and the Alfred. And trauma work is triaged throughout the state and brought to the place where the work can be done. The, the outcomes are magnificent, not just in saved lives, and there are many, many of those, but in downstream morbidity, damage to people, so much reduced because of efficacious treatment at the right place at the earliest possible moment. That system, and, and we did that, as I said, in the 1990s, is now being rolled out across the whole NHS in the United Kingdom and in places like Toronto uh, in, in Canada. So that system worked because the right stakeholders were in the room and we got it right. The third one I'm going to, I'm going to have with you here, and, and uh, it's a public policy I'm, after trauma I'm probably most proud of, but I didn't really design it. Um, we have a Chief Resilience Officer who's actually here, Tony Kent sitting up there, so go and bother him later uh, to talk about resilience. But Tony's job in the 100, uh, Toby's job in the 100 Cities program is not just to work with the City of Melbourne, but with all the other municipalities in Greater Melbourne. So when you think about that earlier example of trauma, the one in local government is the project that Toby is working on in resilience. But here's the, here's the one that I like the best and the one that I like telling around the world. This is the public policy that I think is, it just ticks every single box and it is measurable, it's scalable, it's affordable and it's effective. You'll remember the Black Saturday bushfire. Terrible, terrible event. What most people don't recall is that the 10 days leading up to that were all over 40 degrees. And by, I, I tell our Northern Hemisphere colleagues, that's 104 in the old scale, and it was 46 or 116, and they just look at you disbelievingly, okay? By that Friday, the city itself began to fail. Telecommunications failed, public transport was failing, lifts were failing all over the city. We were losing energy, power, all over the city. We somehow got through that Friday night, Black Saturday happened, and, and then it was, you know, the, the weather broke. I promise you I'll be quick, but don't do it again. Um, I don't like when people hold up things and say stop to me. That's only you know, incitement, if you know me at all. Um, look, the, the, the awful thing during that week, and here is, here is a question for an ethical city. 173 people died in that bushfire. More than 400 people died during that week of heat. What does a city do about its resilience in responding to the fact that heat is a killer and we know our summers are getting hotter and starting earlier? And have a look at our bushfire season this year as an example of that. So we did two things, again relying on data. Um, we digitally mapped the canopy, the urban forest in the city, so that we knew where everything was. By the way, if you're looking for a friend, you can actually email a tree at the City of Melbourne. And if you write an interesting email, they will email back to you. Um, and they, I promise you that happens. So we, we knew the urban canopy. And then we did some uh, thermal mapping of the city itself. And it won't surprise you to know that the city of Melbourne at its outskirts, as you come in towards the centre, the temperature rises. And so when you get to the centre in here, the heat island effect is five degrees hotter. OK, think back to heat, citizens making decisions for them. The really smart urbanists and arborists at the City of Melbourne came up with this as a public policy answer. Plant trees. And diversify our canopy, because we're reliant on elms and plains. Diversify the canopy, and that scientific work was done. But we committed to planting 3,000 trees every year for 10 years from 2010 onwards. And we are on track so far. And when we've done that, we've planted those extra 30,000 trees and increased the canopy from 28% to 40% of the central city. We cool the city by four degrees. And think about that in terms of decision making and public policy making around the well-being, the livability of, of your citizens. And the thing I like about that is, it doesn't matter if your city is a very poor city. Make a start. You don't have to plant, you know, 3,000 a year for 10 years. Or you can be, as the mayor of Tianjin said to me when he heard of that program, he said, I like it, I'll plant a million. And he did. And he did. In, in the last five years, you can go into that great city in, in China and all along the great highways, you'll find teams of people planting colonnades along tens of kilometres of the roads there. 
So I think that is a particularly, a particularly important initiative that sprang from a disruption, a natural disruption, that the city had to respond to. We could not have gone on after that just thinking to ourselves, she'll be right, we'll cope with the next one when it comes. We had to start thinking a long way ahead. So whether it's honest engagement with individual citizens, whether it's engagement with stakeholders, whether it's sharing and collaboration, the three sort of models I've described to you through the 10-year financial plan, the trauma system and the tree planting example, they are ways that the City of Melbourne has responded to the issues that you are considering in your time here today. And the other part that I think is really important is that something I've noticed about this city, and I, I, I'm very proud of this city, this is a conversation city. You know, if you don't have the answers yourself, you can go to any one of a number of different groups. It may be the universities, it may be the private sector, it may be other municipalities, it may be other levels of government, it may be private citizens. But you can go to all of those sources and ask. And I've found unfailingly that help and advice and resources are given. I think that's a very special thing about our city. I'll stop now. <laughs> We can, yeah, we can squeeze some in. I'm happy yeah. to. We'd um, love it if there were any questions. We could take um, maybe two or three questions, um, but please state where you're from and, um, and, and uh, make it a question, not a, not a statement. Uh, anyone? Please. It's, uh, we need a mic. Thank you very much, uh, Bob Meyer. You know me. Uh, we've, we've met a few times before. Uh, my name is Erwin Boermans. I also do guest lecturing here at RMIT and a few other um, universities. My problem is with the, the, the closing note you had in your speech, but there's too many uh, communities that are reinventing the wheel. Um, there are off the shelf solutions in PCAC, for instance, in Brunswick where we can transition towards cleaner environments, where we can help the Chinese, and they come very regularly, as you know, to learn here how to fix their massive challenges. But I can't take them to an education visitor center where we can actually really sit together with them and, um, and, and help them. Are you able to help me in Dandenong with Old Masonic Hall to get that transition to such a transition center, please? Uh, Right. No, promised it to me. No, because Dandenong is not mine. But what you can do is, uh, we we love the idea of bringing people together, and we do create spaces where we can accommodate that. Um, I can't help you with the Masonic Hall in Dandenong, but what you might want to do is contact the City of Melbourne and see if you can use, for instance, Kensington Town Hall, which we've just refurbished beautifully with many many meeting spaces. Similarly, you could try Boyd School. Uh, which is in City Road, an old school which we refurbished as a library with creative spaces and community meeting spaces. Um, or you could try the Kathleen Syme here in Carlton, out behind the old women's. Beautifully renovated primary school of 1871, but again, not just as a library, as a meeting space for the community. There are three spaces in Melbourne where at very, very low cost, or in some cases no cost, there are rooms of all sizes and configurations available for community use. Um, thanks, Michael. Good evening, George. Social Planner um, with the Urban Solutions. Um, look, my question. There's a red light on. Is that it? No, no. Should be a green one. Um, for those who didn't hear that, that question was about 
uh, as, as sort of a concomitant to the tree planting, what do we do about waste water and what benefits were there there? Um, the, the answer was absolutely benefit. We, we embarked on, because you know, you've got to water trees, it turns out. Uh, um, and we knew we'd have to embark on, on major stormwater harvesting. That was, that was the only scale that would give us what we wanted. And, and so we, we got some money from federal government, but mostly it's us. Uh, we did a couple of huge scale stormwater harvesting projects. There's one in the Fitzroy Gardens where, you know, just as you're going down the parade there, if you look left at where the old depot was, there's now a sort of a visitor centre there and a very, very large reclaimed big green space. That, that was a hole about the size of this university. And, and that was one of the, the uh, stormwater projects. Another very large one in Birurung Ma, uh, and of course Royal Park, where we extended some there. We also have plans for some in University Square in Carlton, and, and we've even looked at small scale ones. Darling Street in East Melbourne is the first in the world of a fully reticulated storm and wastewater recycling in ground, in street, highly localised. Um, so everything from the very large scale to the very small scale. Um, by the way, interesting anecdote about our story before I come back to the conclusion of that. When we were doing the one in the Fitzroy Gardens, it's the scene of the old creek, because there was an old creek that, that wound its way from Fitzroy Collingwood down through the gardens there, um, now disappeared. But they found, when they were excavating, all of these sort of vintage beer bottles. <laughs> and we were working out, what, why on earth is this creek full of beer bottles? And the answer was, as workers were leaving the city, the creek was about a one beer bottle walk from the city. So they'd turf it and then continue on their way home. Anyway, uh, we've saved some of them, by the way. Uh, the answer to that was, I think we're now at something like 28% of, of our total water usage on all of our parks and gardens. And if you consider the parks and gardens around Melbourne, thank you to Governor Latrobe for that vision way back at the start as well. That, that's a considerable amount. We're aiming to do more. It'd be nice to get up to 40 to 50%. And the funny thing is the payback period, even though they're very expensive, these are tens of millions of dollars of projects, but the payback period is, is relatively quick um, in, in public expenditure terms because water is so expensive. Um, so the, the, uh, the resounding answer to your question is yes, and in fact you, you can't embark on those programs without thinking of the other things that you have to do. We, we now think, and, and this is again some of the really smart people at the City of Melbourne, you know, we used to think of, of stormwater as something that we put in pipes and put out into the bay. We now think of the city as a catchment and that water is a very precious urban resource. I will have just one last question, yep. please. Uh, yeah, gentlemen the front. Lord Mayor, my name is Ramesh Kumar, I'm from AIMS Australia. Um, how do we measure uh, progress towards an ethical city? For instance, if you look at uh, Melbourne, the number of people who are homeless it has been a big increase. So okay. is, is that something we can look at, you know, whether when you said the cities are for all people, yes. what about the homeless? Okay. Um, you, your, your, first, your first comment is one that I agree with and endorse heartily. If you can't measure something, then you can't manage it. Now, the, the way you determine those measures is, is up for, you know, debate, but we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, for a start, we, we do, and, and the question, let, let's use the homeless as an example. It's not the only one, but let's use that as an example. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to duck shove this to other levels of government. It, it is a split responsibility. You know, no one, federal, state or local, could actually say homelessness is exclusively our problem. I mean, each level of government has a stake in it. Um, the first thing is data. So every second year, we do a street count, particularly of rough sleepers. Um, it's remained about constant, although the people themselves change. It's about 140 uh, at any given time. Um, then every second year, we do a more qualitative survey where we talk to homeless people over a number of conversations and try to elicit from them what would be most helpful for them. It won't surprise you to know that stable accommodation comes pretty near the top of the list. Um, but there are other elements, including connection to primary health services. And, and that's, that's just the really visible part. That's not dealing you know, with the secondary or tertiary homelessness that we understand about. Uh, it, you know, and, and there are different types of homelessness. I'm not going to go into all of that. I don't have time. 
but there are some elements of homelessness that worry me, particularly um, young people who are very vulnerable on the streets, particularly women who are fleeing domestic violence, uh, and, and they are a particularly vulnerable group who, who can be pushed into homelessness as a result of that, that awful scourge. Um, so then, once you've got some data and you know what's happening, the next thing I think you do is develop trusted partners. Um, for us, it's Melbourne City Mission and Front Yard uh, and, and the Salvation Army. In, in fact, on the way here today, there are three homeless men who are in the foyer of Royal Bank, uh, which is the ANZ Bank on the corner of Collins Street and, uh, and Elizabeth Street. So I'm able to ring Anthony at, which I did, uh, well, I got my office to do it, but I told them what to do. Um, uh, we rang Anthony at the Salvation Army, and he will send a team down to engage with those men to see if they wish to be brought up to the Hamadava Cafe, be given food, perhaps clothing, a shower, do they wish to be connected. But in other words, they will, they will connect with them. It might sound down in the weeds and small scale, but that's, that's one way you have to deal with it. We've done two very large housing projects, Common Ground and Elizabeth Street, uh, and more recently Drill Hall, uh, which was the old army barracks where we, we did the apartments above, but then we found we had a need for a health service, so we contracted with Dutagawa at the time, CoHealth now, to provide what is essentially a community health centre for, for people who are homeless. Um, and, and I think, and, and my, my two councils, the two that I've worked with, have been very cooperative in, in seeing what are the programs that we can develop that are going to help, and that might be another building program, for instance. Um, it's, it's no coincidence, we, we have a Melbourneian of the Year that we honour, someone who's done a remarkable job. My Melbourneian of the Year this year is Brian Lipman, who runs Winteringham. Um, I've not seen a model around the world that can take people who've been homeless for four decades straight off the street, put them into housing and have a zero recidivism rate. It, it's a remarkable model of which we should be very proud. And then there's, there's some other things that you can do, um, and, and this is one that I got criticism for, which I thought was unwarranted, as a matter of fact. <laughs> anyway, let me describe to you what it is. Uh, as you go around the city, you'll see people begging, and, and quite a number of them will be homeless. It's, it's, it's obvious. I brought together the police, the Salvation Army, uh, the Public Interest Legal Clearing House, who have a new name now, Justice Connect, I think they're called now, and the Magistrates Court. And what we decided to do was this. We'd send out police with the Salvation Army and engage again with these people who are homeless and beggars. Now, if unfortunately there is aggression or violence or a criminal record, there is a justice track which is required and, and that will be a police matter. And we have found some people who are quite dangerous and, and very wanted who are there. Secondly, if there are professionals and there are gangs of professionals operating in the city, um, they're quite often the ones that you see set up like an encampment, often with a dog, often more than one of them. They haven't been there all night. They've come in and set up camp at about five in the morning to catch the morning rush. Um, and, and they have to be dealt with in a different way as well. But the vast majority, of course, are people who've had some cataclysmic event that has changed the course of their life, or they have substance abuse, alcohol or drug problems, or they have mental illness, or they have the whole lot in, in one terrible package. For those people, what the police do is they insist that they go to court, but they all go on the same day. That means Justice Connect can provide legal representation and marshal their resources. But the magistrate's court can provide a, a magistrate who understands what we're trying to do and is sympathetic to the idea. And that person can be directed to a diversion track, which includes some primary health care, um, sometimes some training if that's possible, even the most basic care, but certainly not a justice track. And in engaging with, with people, the times we've done it, it's called Operation Minter, so if you hear that, you'll know that's what's happening on the streets. Th these are difficult clients, but we've had a success rate of about 50 or 60% in getting people who were completely disconnected from services reconnected to them. So, so they are some of the things that we do. Is it enough? Absolutely not, and I promise you I'll finish right here. The first night I was elected in, in uh, 2008, it's a horrible day. The counting goes on all day, it's electronic. Uh, it was a Saturday and around about midnight the results spat out and, and I won uh, in what was quite a lucky win. And with my team we decided to have a drink and we went down to Cookie in Swanson Street. Many of you will know that, that bar. Um, and we were just going to have a, a, a quiet celebratory drink. And it was a Melbourne sort of, you know, late November, early December night. It was quite chill. There was a light drizzle falling. And I looked across the street 
and there were two young people who would have been the age of my children who were putting down cardboard boxes, not even in a recessed niche, not even in an alcove, in, in the most narrow of doorways. And they were preparing to sleep rough for the night. And I felt deeply ashamed. And I thought to myself, Rob, that's why you're elected mayor. Not to cut ribbons and go to dinners. That's why you're elected. And I've never forgotten that night. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. The, the uh, whole day has been a range of engagement and discussion at, at this end. Um, what we really need now is for all of you to take the reins and provide what you think the city that we need is. We've got three workshops, one around inclusion, which is at the top of the stairs and, and off to your right. One around resilience, which is top of the stairs to your left. There'll be people to help guide you. And then going straight upstairs is ethical urban development. So pick the three, or pick out of those three, which area that you would like to have as a focus to feed into the new urban agenda for Habitat 3. The facilitators will be in the room and will take you through the process so that your input can be used today. Thank you. Thank you all for participating throughout today. Um, it's always a long day with these things, um, and uh, I really appreciate your everybody's input. Um, and I hope that uh, the session that I was in, at least I can say, uh, was a highly engaged session, um, and I'm, I'm sure the other two sessions were also. Um, the purpose of this final wrap-up, and we will literally be here for uh, less than 15 minutes and you'll be out of the door, um, is simply for us to share high-level recommendations, outcomes from each of the three sessions so that everybody who's here gets an insight. Well, first of all, they get played back to them what the key outcomes were of their own session and possibly get a, right, a quick right to comment or reply. Um, but also they get to hear the high-level outcomes of the other two sessions um, that were going on in parallel while they were uh, doing their hard work. So that's the purpose of this session. Um, in no particular order, I might ask Annabelle if you would like to come up first uh, on the inclusive um, uh, stream and uh, deliver or, or speak to your high-level recommendations from your group. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so our group was focused on inclusion of <coughs> the city, and we had a specific focus within that um, relating to the economic inclusion of migrant populations. We had a great panel um, with people from AIMS and multicultural youth organisation, and some of the main recommendations were, um, one was particularly around adaptive planning, so making use of migration, settlement, and labour market data. Uh, to make inclusive planning decisions. There's a lot of discussion about linking the data to decision making. Uh, a group uh, focused on urban solutions um, identified a range of individual solutions for inclusion that we've documented, uh, as well as challenges of the concept of finding community and meaning in a new context. Mm -hmm. um, there was a group focused on the city we need, which feeds into the nine principles of the city we need as part of the UN Habitat process. Um, and they had some key recommendations around ethical behaviour, um, around things like consumerism at the city level and making sure that's ethical. Uh, Recognising the existing skills and knowledge of migrants was an ongoing thing that was formed in a recommendation here, uh, as well as celebrating the multiple identities, uh, multiple cultural identities within the city. Uh, and then a final group was focused on the uh, role of different stakeholders can play um, and some key recommendations that came out of that were around um, uh, city level planning and ways that the, the, the built environment could be adapted to be more inclusive, um, as well as uh, we touched on the role of the media in changing attitudes and shifting attitudes. And then um, uh, there was a key recommendation around the way academia or um, academic institutions could incentivise researchers to be measured not only by the KPIs of how much they publish, but the influence of those publications so that uh, influence on things like policy decisions and practice change could actually be recognised and rewarded by that system. So that's some of what we came up with. Wonderful, thank you.
would any would anyone who was in that session like to add anything? No, I wouldn't either. I think that was my fault. Um, and um, I, I thought what was particularly interesting was the richness and the diversity of the points that were made, including you know uh, issues of communication, media. The, these are pervasive and important um, issues, and they certainly came up in the session that I was in as well. I think we may move directly on to um, the ethical urban development session. Matthew is our rapporteur to take us through the key points. Um, we're just figuring out the resilience one. <laughs> um, so we covered off a bunch of different things, and this is a summary of uh, what we went through. So we uh, very quickly, Ralph and I tried to summarise a uh, very detailed conversation, so feel free to correct me. Um, so we recognised quite a few things, and it was that situation where we were focusing on urban development and making sure that we weren't being biased in what we were doing. Some of the principles that we saw were recognising things like people automatically working in offices, it wasn't recognising other kinds of work. So making sure that um, biases are recognised, but also the diversity um, of individuals, so be it um, religious institutions being need to be um, better engaged, uh, and the interests of various stakeholders, so the profit interests of the private sector, um, the community interests, the environmental interests, and that kind of thing. Um, being better at communication and the skills around communication and around engagement as well being critically important for all state stakeholders, so government engagement as well as community groups being able to engage, and embracing new media through that as well, so social media and everything else. Um, ensuring that engagement happens in the project, not in just a piecemeal, are we consulted with people, but being on the vision right through to the delivery, be that of a project, be that of a city plan um, across all levels. Um, the need for open and transparent governance, uh, we didn't include there, but also the need for that to be supported by open and transparent data, um, and for that to be uh, governed by the rule of law to prohibit things or at least limit things like corruption uh, that are quite a big problem in some places. Uh, substance over marketing, uh, there was a round of applause when that was um, <laughs> put forward in the group and making sure that it's not about the spin, it's actually about the authenticity of what's happening. Um, and the continuity of that of the, and of the participation between stakeholders through that uh, whole thing. So it's not just authentic at the start, it's authentic when you deliver it, it's authentic 20 years later. Um, and recognising the need for there being a strong business case, but for the business case not just to be profit, but to be public good. Uh, and be the broader impact of, of what you're doing in terms of developing ethical cities. So. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Martin, and especially for our short mm -hmm. notice agreeing to act as a representative rapporteur. Um, does anybody want to add any points, uh, who, who was in the session, want to add any points that, that, to those that Matthew's just made? Everybody wants to go home. Yes, one. Um, we didn't uh, do anything about uh, economic incentives to incentivise uh, um, economic incentives and changing economic structures in order to incentivise regulatory frameworks and policy frameworks to facilitate ethical urban development. Thank you. And we will make sure, of course, that, that is in uh, the, the report and one of the take-home points. A anything else? I mean, it occurs to me just while you're thinking that um, uh, from my experience in, in, in urban development, and I'm sure it's similar to those uh, others in the room who, are, who have been involved in various stages or various ways, um, you know, the built environment industry is a project-based industry. Um, you know, it is a number of temporary organisations, those temporary or, or temporary networks which are put together around particular projects, literally. Um, and, um, and so there is a tendency, I think, to think about stakeholder consultation as a time-based temporary thing around a particular project. And I think it was a, was a realisation through the discussion this afternoon that what we really need in terms of ethical urban development is a much a permanent, if you like, uh, uh, um, means of, of um, continuously um, uh, consulting, engaging, and empowering across, um, particularly across disaffected or uh, uh, what are currently underrepresented um, parts of society. 
So um, I'm stalling a bit because I'm wondering whether we're ready for the next one. We are. Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks. So I Liz. think it's Liz. No, it's Linda. I just wanted to. Linda. Say, no. the oh, sorry. Point and the others. Yep. I was in there. Um, but it, just to recognise that with the pace of change that's going on, participation, particularly by vulnerable communities, takes more time sometimes mm. than we're willing to give it. Yes. I think that just reinforces the point. Thanks, uh, Linda. Okay, we'll now move on to resilience. Um, and our rapporteur for the resilience workshop uh, is, is Liz, in fact. So, welcome, with Liz. Liz. <coughs> Always yours. Okay, and I'll be quick. Um, yeah, we. I think because Michael was in the room, we followed our instructions very carefully. So <laughs> most of our recommendations were framed in the way we were asked to frame them about there is a need for, therefore we recommend. Um, and so we did that script, but you'll see from those that they really cover sort of three things quite holistically. Resilience is. Um, often a, a very broad and complex concept for people to get their head around and I think it's interesting when we came back to three things that are really about the changing climate, how we organise ourselves and get things done and, and really who we are. So the first one looks at how we prepare for a changing climate and that the goal that relates to a safe city needs to include climate change and I think that's probably quite easy to justify and, and um, will maybe some support. The second one is that there is a need for community-led policy and project development, um, but you need to have the skills to be able to do that, and those skills need to relate to systemic thinking, um, that whole co-design with communities, whether they take a long time or a short time, bringing in multi-parties, and truly, um, I guess, genuine collaboration. And so those skills need to be identified according to, um, at a neighbourhood level. We talked a lot about scale and a lot about structure and how you make things happen. Um, but identifying needs at a neighbourhood level also came through as, as quite particular because it's very easy to go into communities and tell them what they need. And I think the last one that's really about trying to um, recognise our Indigenous knowledge, history and, and people is, is actually going to the heart of who we are. And we need to be honest about who we are and where we are, and learning from our past so that we can truly move forward in a more collaborative and honest way. The scale and structure is difficult, as was how you make it happen, because um, if it's all bottom up, it's hard work. If it's top down, it won't happen. And um, when we were trying to put into the matrix who is responsible for what at what level, um, we didn't get very far. Um, the national governments should build nations. <laughs> and the state government should deliver essential services. You had a whole two hours. Sure I know, I know. <laughs> and that local government is about community building and you need all three. And I guess um, if I put one of my observations from today was the language used by the Lord Mayor about homelessness and how it had split responsibilities. And I thought it was quite telling that he didn't use the word shared responsibilities because it doesn't cut up neatly. It's not a cake of responsibility and everyone takes their little piece. Mm -hmm. And um, those overlaps is, is what matters, and that's where the gaps happen in people also. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I, I, my own observation is that I think it's quite interesting um, that in that group that uh, there's ostensibly around resilience and, and, and um, that um, uh, inclusion, indigenous knowledge, art, history, culture comes through so powerfully and I think it tells us something about resilience and how we operationalise the term resilience in practice um, and I credit to that group for the work that was done uh, to, to draw out um, those broader uh, future city uh, con conclusions. Um, so I think it's down to me to close, isn't it? Okay. Um, so I won't keep you more than a minute longer other than to say that um, as you've probably uh, already heard, but uh, uh, for, for, for the record, um, the next step is for us to collect in the, in the city's program and World Vision, we will collect together all the hard work that's been done in the three parallel <coughs> sessions uh, this afternoon uh, on paper, on sticky notes, on, on various bits of furniture. And, um, and we will um, attempt to, uh, in a fair and 
um, accountable way uh, translate that into our report uh, back to the Urban Thinkers Campus uh, process, which the deadline is horrifically short. I think we've got about a week to do that. Um, we will capture as much as we can uh, from today's events, including video clips, etc., and get them online on ethicalcities.org. I, um, I uh, strongly um, recommend or, or encourage you to continue the conversation. Uh, many of you have been tweeting on um, hashtag ethical cities. Um, keep the conversation going. Um, our plan is to keep this momentum up through the PrepCom, which is in Jakarta in July, and to Quito in October uh, Habitat 3, um, where we uh, want to have a vocal voice, a strong voice, advancing the argument for ethical cities. Um, and, and, and really, um, that I think is a very important agenda, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, of course. Uh, I think it's about the uh, implementation of inevitably the new cities, the new edges and centres of cities that are being constructed as we speak. So it's about thinking beyond the material. It's about the material, but it's beyond the material as well. It's thinking about the how and the who. Uh, it's thinking about the politics of engagement in our cities, of course, whether that's a small p politics or otherwise. So once again, thank you everybody um, for staying the course and do watch the website and do keep in contact with us uh, by all means and we'll, we'll certainly be following up um, with yourselves. Have I missed anything out? I'm just going to do some... Excellent. I'll hand over to Michael to do the final bits. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, an org organisation of uh, a day like today to bring all the different sectors together doesn't happen by itself. Uh, it takes both a lot of champions uh, within the network that we all, all have, but it takes a core group of dedicated people. And uh, firstly, I'd like to note uh, Joyardi Das from uh, World Vision, who can't be here today due to uh, family uh, issues that have, that have uh, come up. Uh, but she uh, had been a strong backbone to the program and the focus, and, and obviously Jackie, um, who's been uh, constantly involved. Jackie Smith, so thank you. Um, and, and, and Annabelle, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, from our own organisation and, and our own team, obviously with, with Ralph and, and Liz as Deputy Director, uh, these sorts of things are really important. Um, we, being able to bring people together and how we do this but uh, Brendan Barrett and, and Keith Williams, who uh, have um, planned, uh, put a lot of mind, sweat and tears in, in, in from our side to make this happen. We had someone that was organising this um, pull out and go to Sydney, um, and they stepped up and just made this happen. Um, and so a, a special thanks to Kit and, and Brendan and, and the rest of the I'd also like to thank the photographers and uh, videographers that we've had throughout the day. I hope you've had a chance to be filmed or photographed as, as the day went on. Also the IT, uh, these things don't happen uh, by magic. The catering was sensational. Um, anything we wanted, they provided, so we're very happy. So, And finally, the, um, the volunteers really make a, a, a big difference, and, and Paul Lewis sort of uh, <coughs> is an intern with our program. Uh, connected out to a great range of volunteers that have been uh, superb all the way through, e even including getting a bit of harassment from the Lord Mayor. Um, very good. Everyone's been exceptionally helpful all, all the way uh, through the day. So um, there's drinks now at the Mac Hotel, and um, uh, we'd, we encourage you all there to continue the conversations and, and discussion, and we'll um, uh, uh, please join us. If you go down onto Swanson Street, you turn left, you get to the corner, um, turn left again, and about halfway down Franklin Street, you'll see an old-fashioned little hotel just sitting there, and that's the Mac Hotel. Please uh, join us there. So um, without any more, uh, I look forward to you being continued focus on this campaign leading up to the new urban agenda, and uh, thank you all very much. Thanks.